mTOR is a growth promoting pathway, right? It is not an initiator. It is a growth promoting pathway, which is stimulated in a multiple, a multitude of ways. mTOR is stimulated in muscle by branched chain amino acids, in particular leucine. And I'm going to lay the foundation and I'm going to come back to it because it's very important that people understand this. So mTOR in skeletal muscle, mTOR in the liver, the pancreas, and the brain. And the reason this is important is because it is a growth promoting pathway. In the media and in some of these groups that are arguing to go more vegetarian, they will say mTOR is a bad, that stimulating this pathway is negative. And we're going to really unpack it because it's very important. mTOR stimulation in skeletal muscle, which by the way, it is exquisitely sensitive to. Mechanistic target of rapamycin, this protein kinase complex is exquisitely sensitive to an amino acid called leucine. This is necessary for muscle protein synthesis. If you do not trigger this pathway, you do not stimulate muscle. We know that skeletal muscle is always important. We know that your survivability improves the healthier your muscle is. And we can agree upon that right? Longo would agree upon that. Now, it requires a very specific dose of protein to actually stimulate that tissue. And that is two and a half grams of leucine. And for the listener, that is between 30, that is a minimum of 30 grams of protein per meal to stimulate this tissue. If you are below that number and 30 grams of protein, that would be four ounces, maybe five. If you are below that, you do not stimulate mTOR pathway. Can you imagine what that does over time? Tell us. If you do not stimulate that pathway over time, you will not have the kind of muscle that you need. Mm -hmm. If you have breakfast and you're having one egg and you're having a small turkey sandwich and you're so that your first breakfast, you're getting 15 grams of protein and you're going, oh, I have my protein intake. You're not stimulating mTOR. And by the way, that first meal of the day is most important, which we'll come back to. I don't care what time it is. If you go on a low protein diet, you will not stimulate your tissue. You will not provide it with the amino acids it needs for survivability, right? So now let's talk about mTOR in other parts of the body. mTOR in the pancreas and the liver are exquisitely and more sensitive to carbohydrates and insulin. If you believe that mTOR is bad, mechanistic target of rapamycin is a bad growth promoter, then you have to believe that excess carbohydrates are bad. And you feel like that's the part that's not being talked about by people. It's like we're putting all the fo focus on protein. Right. But what about this other aspect? Not only here? that, that's like saying when you exercise, because exercise stimulates mTOR, exercise is bad for you. So if you believe that protein is the culprit, then you would also say, well, I shouldn't be exercising either. And I think that there are people yeah. that even if they come from the world of like more plant-based eating that I've been starting to see that are talking about how protein is important. We need to put it's more essential, focus on but, it. But it's also an essential nutrient. Right. There are 20 amino acids, nine of which we must eat. Not only must we eat them, we must eat them in a certain amount to get the stimulus that we need. This is the most overlooked aspect of all of nutritional sciences. And it's interesting because even the RDA doesn't recognize the meal requirement of certain amino acids. And listen, if you look at the back of a label, you'll see fat and you'll see the fat breakdown, right? Is it you know saturated fat? Is it monounsaturated fat? When you see carbohydrates, you'll see sugar, you'll see fiber. And then you get down to protein and all you see is protein. <laughs> but there are 20 amino acids and they are not created equal. The protein in quinoa and the protein in broccoli has in a different amino acid than the protein in beef. Or the protein in chicken. Yet we cannot make these blanket statements that if you just get your protein, you're going to be okay. No, I do want to acknowledge, you know, there's a gentleman, even though he has maybe completely different views on where to get that protein and other stuff. He's been on the podcast before, but I've seen some clips. He's pretty vocal in the plant world. Yeah. His name is Simon Hill. Mm. And again, you know, he has very, his own specific views. You have your views, but I do want to acknowledge that I've been seeing more and more people like him say like, look, 
this is important and we need to make sure we hit all these amino acids. Yeah. Again, they may have different arguments of how to get there, but I'm starting to see that conversation where previously that conversation was just like, protein's bad. Right. You don't need all this stuff. But you do need all of it. And exactly. It, and it's amazing. And I really appreciate that he's saying that because we all want the same thing. This is not a conversation of division. It needs to be a conversation of inclusion. And when you have people say, we should eat less than the RDA, so 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is based on crude nitrogen balance studies, the idea that we would then go and say, you should eat less than that, the average woman eats 75 grams of protein a day. The average male eats 100 grams of protein a day. The advice to say, based on epidemiology or blue zones, that we should eat less than that is going to be catastrophic. I think the other thing with blue zones that sometimes is a little confusing because here you are And there's talking. all multiple different blue zones and they sure. do multiple different things. Totally. And they eat multiple different diets. Yeah. The, it, and definitely the, the, the spin on blue zones is that they all have these things and beans are central and they don't eat a lot of animal protein, even the ones that do. But here's one thing that could be an interesting link. I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts on it is that because a lot of your muscle development, your skeletal muscle, as yeah. I'm hearing from you, is sort of like that, you know, 18 to 40 space. Yeah, like, right? yeah, let's go. You yeah, know? That's your 18 to 40 space, 18 to 40 years old. Yeah. You're really establishing the foundation. Right. Then, okay, great. When you're older, could you get away no, with, with less? Potentially, no. like I'm talking about like you when you're in more. your 90s and that sort of thing. You need more because again, Muscle is a nutrient sensor and there is something called anabolic resistance that happens. What this means is your muscle doesn't sense the amino acids the same way it did as robustly that it did in your youth. In order to have healthy muscle respond in a robust way like you did it in your youth, you must get a more bolus amount of protein. For older individuals like my dad, he eats 50 grams of protein twice a day. And people are like, oh, that's so much. But no, it's actually not. And ultimately, we must understand our perspective about where we have come to understand our nutritional needs. Nutrition science is relatively new. I mean, they, they were just discovering amino acids in the 1940s. That's not that long ago. And the recommendations have yet to catch up. There is a consensus paper. There's the ProDage paper. Uh, it's a ProDage consensus, and this is the European Working Group for Sarcopenia, because ultimately we have to bring it back to what are the health outcomes that we want. We want strength. We want glucose regulation. We want metabolic control. The way in which we do this, the vehicle by which we can manage and mitigate these issues is skeletal muscle. Do you feel like there's any population sets that are out there or micro communities or groups that do a good job at this? That's or a really good question. Is it that industrialization has become so Rampant. prolific that yeah. we really don't have any groups that we can kind of look at, even if it was, yeah. you know. Uh, I wish to say that we did, but we don't now because we are so industrialized. And then the other thing is that physical activity and movement is optional. It was never that way. We had to do it. There was no you go you will, and work out. You just have to work out to survive. So can, because you, so you, can, can you imagine now we have taken away a stimulus that is necessary for the body. You know, we have taken away a stimulus which is required. And these conversations are so important, these longevity conversations and also these protein conversations because, again, you are not going to maintain healthy muscle if you do not optimize it in your youth. It is very, very difficult. And every person will tell you. And, and let's even take sarcopenia uh, off. The plate, you know, like we take it out, out of there. What about osteoporosis? Osteoporosis bone is made up of 40% protein. It is very vital to get high quality nutrients and for us to understand that, you know, also when we think about the blue zones, they're not overeating, right? These issues that people want to pin onto protein, it couldn't be further from the truth because we do have evidence that we know that individuals need higher protein as they age. And not only that, we also know that any study will show you that 0.8 grams, if you compare 0.8 grams per kilogram to one gram per kilogram, the people with the higher protein do better. So it's very curious as to how there is still arguments in this space. So one of the things that ends up yeah. coming up in part of the conversation, right, as we unpack all that, yeah. you know, and thank you for being here again and, you know, walking us through all this, is people often say, well, 
it's not really the protein that we're talking about. It's often the things that get associated with in their instance where they're talking about it, where they have like, let's say beef with animal protein, right? It's uh, dietary cholesterol, which we know, right? Which, is by not, the way, in 2015, that was taken out of the, the guidelines. Totally, 100%. It took 20 years to do it. It took 20 years to do it. Right. So perhaps what we're beginning to hear now is maybe not true. Yeah. So- yeah, let's say let's say that let's yeah. say also uh, ele elevated levels of like LDL, mm -hmm. uh, lipoprotein B, like these things often get attributed to animal sources of either right. fat or protein. Which there's no mechanism. First of all, yes, it does get attributed. There is no evidence to support that animal protein in particular is the culprit. If you have excess saturated fat, that can be a problem. If you have excess calories, that can be a problem. And when we think about beef, beef is, you know, the fat in beef is mostly monounsaturated. Upwards beyond 40% of the fat in beef is monounsaturated. I heard that for the first time on another podcast. Okay. With, uh, Rob Wolf and uh, Joe Rogan were talking. It is monounsaturated fats, yet we demonize beef. Also, saturated fat within context, our body makes palmitate it makes a saturated fat. If that was so bad, why would our body make it? It's confusing. So perhaps it is the context and it really is about the total caloric load rather than, and the data would support that, that when calories are controlled, beef, fat are not an issue. If you have excess saturated fat, excess calories, now you have an issue. So let's run through because, you know, we've been doing a lot of newsletters for my community mm -hmm. on sort of optimal lab levels, right, through some of the major categories of things that are there. And I think that the most beautiful aspect, and I actually had an idea for a nonprofit. I'm going to okay. tell you a little later on. You give me your thoughts on okay. it. But one of the things that's happening now that people can get access to uh, more frequent testing, mm. the cost of text testing is is in some places, if you know how to navigate, it's kind of coming down. There's a lot of startups and other things that are trying mm -hmm. to make it easier, not just to track your glucose, but also to get more regular testing for yourself. And so the idea would be that it, you could see firsthand, again, sometimes people disagree, what are the lab yeah. levels to track, what is optimal versus not, but I'd love to see it yeah. from your standpoint. So if somebody was incorporating more protein into their diet to really have this muscle yeah. centric medicine. I love that. I love this. Okay. We're, I'm going to highlight. Yes. Yeah. If you run down okay. through the top ones, including fasting insulin yes. down to like some of the top, uh, you know, uh, triglycerides. Well, I'm going to point out the ones that I think are really important. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, let's, this is really important. So when individuals eat protein, so for every hundred grams of protein, your body generates 60 grams of glucose for every hundred grams of protein your body generates 60 grams of glucose. That's fascinating. So what you will see in blood work is you may see higher, and this is I see this all the time, you will see higher levels of blood glucose. And the reason is, is if your carbohydrates are controlled, your body becomes very good at gluconeogenesis, at generating its own blood glucose. And it could be upwards of 100 which is really interesting. People say, oh, you want to keep it lower. You want to keep it in your 80s. And I would argue, I would say, listen, your body is becoming very efficient and relying on your own blood glucose rather than- External sources. Exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. So that is something you will see specific to a higher protein diet. Um, now let's talk about insulin. Now, while their blood sugar remains higher, their hemoglobin A1C may also be higher. We are not talking about six. I'm talking about 5.6, 5.7, which I am absolutely fine with. Insulin now will actually be lower. It'll be less than five. Yeah, mine was like 2.3 recently. There you go. So you're, are you eating a lower carbohydrate diet? I do eat a lower carbohydrate okay. diet. So those are some of the big influences that and you'll just see. just for everybody who's listening yeah. and if you're not familiar with our past episodes, ton yeah. of plant food just not a lot of refined carbohydrates okay. inside of my diet. Um, and you have to understand your body can also manage that. So that works great for you. Right, for me, for me, yeah. exactly. So when I was working on some of the earlier studies at um, University of Illinois, one of the, the things is that triglycerides, and Don was very sharp in 
when some he was able to look at what a tri, uh, optimal triglyceride would be, right? So we want it less than 100. And he would say, if an individual is eating greater than 140 grams of carbohydrates, that he will see triglycerides elevated. But if they went to 140 grams of carbohydrates or less, they will see a 20% reduction in fasting triglycerides. Mm. And this is just something very interesting to see when you are looking at blood work to see if triglycerides are elevated, perhaps this individual is eating too much glucose, yeah. too much carbohydrates. Yeah. And that's generally most functional medicine doctors, and there's plenty of them that are also vegan as well, that'll mm -hmm. tell you as soon as they see these elevated triglycerides, yeah. there's too much carbohydrate intake inside the diet. Yeah. One of the other things that I also see is those that are eating a higher protein diet, and I don't know the mechanism of action as to why this is, but cortisol seems to run a little bit higher. And I don't actually think that that's a negative. I think it's the body regulating glucose. It's just contributing to glucose regulation. So those are really the big things that I see. I also will see, and again, I, I don't want to just, those are the ones for sure that I see as an interface with protein whether it's saturated fat and if someone is a hyper responder, I really believe in terms of LDL and cholesterol that there is a huge genetic set point and you know, anything above 250 is likely genetic, right? Um, I, I've been above 250 before. I know I do have some genetic stuff that's yeah. going in my family. I've run an NMR profile uh -huh. test. I'm due for one. I did one like a year ago. So you ago. look at your ApoB and they say, okay, yes. it should be my less ApoB than was elevated. So that was a little bit, you know. So it was below 100 now or below, depending on what it is. I'll have to run my new yeah. NMR report. Yeah. I'm going to share with the community Amazing. and everything. Because I've been way more targeted in the last, you know, since that mm -hmm. last report that I had where I did my, I used a company, I think it's called True Diagnostics or something like okay. that. Okay. And uh, they have a nice uh, report, no affiliation with them. Um, I'm overdue for that, and I want to see, right? I want I to see wait. what like my particle size is yep. and everything like that because my LDL has uh, been more elevated in the past. Okay. And everybody would say run the particle size. My particle size in some instances was high, but I wasn't as strict with my carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, intake. right? But now I'm way more because we know that carbohydrates will help activate HMG CoA reductase. And one of the other things that we see, um, gosh, what was I going to tell you? Oh, LDL cholesterol is individuals that are hypothyroid. Sometimes you'll see higher levels of cholesterol because the receptor is, you know, it, the receptor works with the thyroid receptor. So if someone is hypothyroid, oftentimes you see a higher LDL. What are other things that people often uric acid? Feel? We should talk also. We yeah, should yeah, let's talk about uric acid. Uric We've acid done a couple is another thing. On it. We've had okay. Dr. Richard Johnson on the okay. podcast as well as David Perlmutter. So let's amazing. Talk about uric so that's acid. just something else that I look at. Typically, the lower the better. Oftentimes, if people are above six, men seem to run higher. Um, it's just another marker that I tend to take a peek at. Uh, as it relates to metabolic health. And of course, there's a whole slew, but what are the ones that we could specifically say this is protein related to diet? Um, those are some of the things. And I'm actually starting to do some very interesting blood work experiments. I am very interested in seeing what people's blood work are post-training mm. to see as we get to this conversation of myokines and CRP and white blood cells, these are impacted upon exercise. So part of the work that I'm doing, I'm not ready to release the data, but I am looking at training and is this efficient and effective exercise prescription by increasing in some of these myokines. Got it. Anything else that's out there, like sometimes you hear things like people saying that, you know, too much animal protein is inflammatory. If they actually wanted to look, right? Yeah. Forget about the studies yeah, yeah. and everything else like that that's out there. Yeah. Is there anything that they want to look? blood work in their diet to actually see if their levels of inflammation are actually, yeah. you know, exceeding. Well, you know, I think what you're getting at is maybe TMAO is a, is it's, Could a, be TMO. it's marker. And I will say that it's actually much higher in fish and higher in vegetables. So there are markers that people attribute to say animal-based products, which are just not like the interface is not there. The data isn't there. I think that when we are talking about inflammation, we have to think about total calorie load. And that's what's actually most valuable. And part of your argument, as I understand, and yeah. correct me again, is that also because you're getting a bigger bang for buck with higher quality fats and proteins, mm. you're just going to need to eat less. 
like total calories yeah. comparatively. Is that well, part of I the Well, I mean, argument? in general, we're overfeeding. We are an overfed society and we are not eating, the majority of us are not eating super high quality food. Weight management is really important. Body composition management is really important. And, you know, it's interesting, you had mentioned kind of the rodent studies and the rodent studies are arguably obese models and they're ad libitum fed, they're 40%, you know, they're overfed 40%. So when you see changes in IGF-1 or something like that, you're looking at an obese rat, mm. not necessarily looking at a healthy individual. So there's a lot of, and the reason I bring that up is because you were saying, okay, well, are there certain ways in which we can uh, kind of pin certain behaviors on certain things? And I would say, I haven't seen that in terms of protein intake. Um, you know, because protein is not, it's so valuable that it's not wasted. It's utilized. Again, we go through 300 grams of protein turnover a day. You know, it's not, um, it, it's required amino acids. Let's talk about your dad for a second. You mentioned him <laughs> earlier, right? I think you've met him. Have you met him? Oh, I feel like I you know. have at one event or I another. I can't picture his face. So maybe if you show me a photo, <laughs> I'll remember. Uh, yeah. You know, you were talking about his protein intake yeah. right? and how kind of his day looks. And you said, how old is he? Right 75. Now? 75. Oh, he's going right? to correct me. Sorry, dad. 74. A yeah. young 74. A young 74. So what does his diet look like? It's about you know, 150 is... grams of protein uh -huh. divided in a compressed feeding window. So he's eating in an eight to nine hour window. Mm -hmm. He's hitting 50 grams of protein per meal. Mm -hmm. High and fats, low carbs. Like, what, what would that food look like for him? Beef. He eats a lot of eggs, a lot of beef. Um, he lives in Ecuador, a lot of chicken. Mm -hmm. Beef is very expensive down there. And is his, uh, you know, not to put your dad on the spot, but is also he keeps his carbohydrate he intake does. low? He does. And then how about for yourself? You know, let's talk about your day okay. and like what that looks like before um, we jump back to longevity. <laughs> and a few yeah, other yeah, things yeah. Like um, so I am a higher protein individual. Yeah. My first meal of the day, I haven't even eaten yet. I will typically eat maybe 11 or noon, and that meal will be uh, 50 grams of protein, whether it's a beef or chicken meal, something like that. And maybe I'll have a little bit of greens, nothing crazy, a little bit of fat. And then I'll have another small meal and then a bigger meal before dinner. Now, I thought I heard you say earlier in the interview that breakfast is kind of like one the of those things. The most important meal. Right. The, the first most important meal, meal. We should say the first meal of the day is the most important. The first meal of the day. And, and yeah. I've had a lot of women come on the mm -hmm. podcast and talk about how, you know, women's needs are a little bit different than mm -hmm. men and they're on the infradian rhythm and other mm. stuff. And again, there's variation in individuals, even within genders that are there. Yeah. And how often uh, there can be pros and cons, especially if a woman is in her prime fertility years, mm. right? For fasting, you mean? For for fasting or eating like a later window of like mm. lunch is the first meal. Any hot yeah. takes on that? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about the first meal of the day and why that's so important because this really services everybody. First meal of the day is most important whenever you have that because it is the, the meal that you are primed for. You have not eaten, you're in a catabolic state you are fasted essentially. So the definition of fasting is anything greater than eight hours without eating, right? So if we say, hey, Drew, got to go get your fasting blood work, that would mean eight hours or more of not eating. That first meal of the day is priming your body to get your muscle right and your blood sugar regulation right. The way in which you do that, this is a 100% mostly fail-proof way if you get high protein, and I would argue between 40 and 50 grams that first meal, you are going to set yourself up for metabolic regulation for the rest of the day. And here's why. Number one, you are going to stimulate, regardless of your age, muscle protein synthesis. Whether you are 20 or you are 65 or you are my dad at 74, you will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. You must hit that first opportunity. The other part is protein is very satiating and there's work by Heather Leidy and they looked at brain fMRIs. It's almost as if protein augments willpower. It releases certain gut hormones that really help with satiation. Also, it has a high thermic effect of food, meaning it takes energy to utilize it. So if people are concerned about weight management, optimizing for muscle, this is the way to do it. 
takes 20% of the calories. So for example, if you have 100 calories of protein, and I'm making this very black and white, it, nobody just eats protein, right? Unless you're maybe just eating egg whites. But for every 100, so if you eat 100 grams of protein, then 20% of those calories, so 100 calories, sorry, of protein, 20% of those calories will be utilized to metabolize that protein. So your net caloric is 80 calories. So by leveraging the dietary choices, number one, you're stimulating muscle. You must hit that opportunity. You are being able to balance blood sugar. Again, if you train the body to be accustomed to eating protein, your body will not require external carbohydrate sources in that way you become very efficient. Your blood sugar will remain stable. So that first meal of the day is most important. Again, and also carbohydrates, I think about carbohydrates in a meal threshold amount. And I recommend people do not exceed between 40 and 50 grams. And this is just a great take home point for your listener, between 40 and 50 grams of carbohydrates per meal. And the reason is because we cannot at rest, unless you're out exercising, dispose of more. And when you think about glucose disposal, you think about muscle, you think about what's required for liver and gut and, and all of these processes, brain. So, and again, the definition of diabetes is a two hour blood, you know, blood sugar seeing over greater than 120. So in order to manage blood sugar, we are looking at a 40 to 50 grams or less of carbohydrates per meal. Got it. And so that was a very long winded answer to your question. But yeah. I wanted to make sure that there's some great takeaways for your listener, especially the woman, 50, 40 to 50 grams of protein per meal. Knock that out. Get that right. And any thoughts on, you know, how soon that happens? Because you, I know it's a unique day for you. You were on one podcast, yep. <laughs> you're on another podcast. So I know a lot of times when I'm yeah. not eating, I feel a little bit more focused and stuff. But do you think that there is some importance or truth, and it's okay if you don't, yeah. for, you know, making sure that women, again, in their yeah. prime fertile years, fertility years, whether they're interested in having yes. kids or not, you know, typically like you hear a lot of conversation mm. in the space of fasting of like, I'm going to skip breakfast and right. I'm going to go, my first meal is typically like a lunch meal. Right. Right. Is that more detrimental to women? Do you have a hot take on that? Yeah. Let's think about what the body has in store to manage elevated levels of blood sugar. So the body has one way to deal with glucose. That's insulin. One way. The body has multiple ways to deal with low blood sugar, whether it's glucagon, whether it is cortisol, whether it is growth hormone. So if an individual's blood sugar is getting too low, you do see increases in cortisol, you do see increases in counter-regulatory stress hormones. That being said, if someone is trying to get pregnant, I personally do not recommend fasting. It is an added stress, just you know, from an anecdotal perspective, I had two babies in two years or whatever, two and a half years. I don't necessarily recommend that. But the um, I was not fasting during that time. I wanted to eliminate that kind of external stress on my body. And also for my patients, I don't recommend them fasting if they're trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a stressor. There's one other thing that uh, has seems to be some poll. You know, mm. again, these are observational studies, yeah, yeah. so we have to weigh them out. Which means they're low quality data. Okay, got yeah. it. Is there one, so one takeaway, because it's mm -hmm. good to, to talk about this, is that um, some of them seem to show that people who eat breakfast, mm -hmm. right? Again, yep. not getting into the quality. We're not talking about cereal and other things like that. We're talking yeah. about higher quality, what would be considered maybe more like a European style mm -hmm. breakfast, right? Charcuterie board or some cheeses or things like that. And maybe some, you know, a yeah. little, bit, little bit of food in the morning do better. And would you say that we just don't have the data because observational is too low quality, we can't come yeah. to that conclusion? I think that it depends on what health outcome we're looking at. Is it that they do better because their blood sugar is maintained? Do we have an idea of what the um, macronutrients are at that meal? I think that if a meal is high quality protein, I think that's amazing. But in terms of, again, we always have to think, well, what is the health outcome we're looking at in Got that it. way? 
But uh, I also am not against fasting and I'm certainly not against breakfast. Again, I believe that we do have to think about, you know, protein is very important in a 24-hour period, what you are getting. And then the second layer to that is protein in a discrete meal threshold, which is really important to understand, which again, the science is there, but the recommendations have not yet caught up. That is going to believe to be what I believe to be the future when they start understanding that meals are, there's an amino acid requirement per meal. So 24 hour period of dietary protein, understanding that meal distribution is really important, whether someone is eating breakfast or not eating breakfast or wanting to get pregnant or not wanting to get pregnant, we have to account for the essential need for protein. So we were talking about blood work and some of the markers about how could you make sure that if you were eating a more protein centric diet, yeah. where do you wanna see like the labs and things like that? What is the best way for the person who's listening today Mm. What is the best way to know for them, like definitively, that they are under muscled, right? Yes. What a great question. I think that's going to be very difficult to identify just with blood work. And yeah. This is a very sharp question. And it doesn't have to be blood work. Yeah. It could be yeah. DEXA scans, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. it might be. Also, very important conversation. Yeah. Right now, the way in which society is, is we are very fat focused. We have body mass index and we're very good at measuring body fat percentages. In fact, a DEXA would do that. In terms of measuring skeletal muscle mass, we're not great at that. We have the appendicular lean mass index, which was typically developed. One of the reasons that we look at that would be for sarcopenia or diseases of muscle. But this is not a common marker that individuals look at. People are I, not looking for it. They're not looking for it. Not only that, um, I'm actually writing up where I'm co-writing a paper right now with an amazing PhD uh, from someone named Rabinowitz or Rabinowitz's lab, Alexis Cowan. And we are looking at what would be an optimal skeletal muscle mass for say someone like you. We don't actually know what that number is yet. Hmm. And I know that your question was, how do we know if someone is in an ideal muscle range? We don't actually. We can defer it. We can do that by, again, looking at blood sugar regulation because we know muscle is a metabolic organ. We can look at that by, you know, assuming that their triglycerides are good, that their insulin is good, that their hemoglobin A1C is good. Um, muscle is a site for fatty acid oxidation. However, when we are looking at the health of your tissue, number one, the best way to do that would be a CT or MRI. Completely unrealistic or ultrasound, but that would again be looking at individual components of the tissue, also somewhat unrealistic to, you know, when an individual goes to their primary care physician to say, hey, you know, what, what are my body metrics? Very unrealistic. We do not at this moment have a great way, I am convinced of looking at the quality of skeletal muscle mass. And I wanna separate this from the quantity. Does a DEXA do it? A DEXA does it indirectly. A dual X-ray machine does it indirectly. It extrapolates from lean, you know, looking at lean tissue, which includes liver and bone. Skeletal muscle, identifying skeletal muscle on its own is not done well in clinical sciences right now as it translates to a medical practice. So the answer is, it would be really hard for me to tell you your optimal muscle mass. However, we do know that your strength is the best indicator. The stronger you are, you know, and someone will be like, well, how many push-ups should I do? I think that that's a really difficult question to ask. That has to be, it is very individual. It is very based on a training age, how long you've been training, you know, and that's just an example, whether it's squat or bench press or deadlift. We must understand that part of this is the perception and perspective focused on fat has really overshadowed everything. So so we just haven't had a lot of resources and smart people thinking about the exact way to answer that question. Yes, in a realistic way. Also, it hasn't been primary. Right now, when we look at skeletal muscle, it's typically in young male athletes. And you know, now it's it's getting more balanced, but it's either looking at an athletic population or it's looking at a very sick population very sick population. We're not, you know, and there are papers out there that look at the skeletal muscle mass, but it's 
very difficult to say what an optimal level. We can say this is a number that would indicate disease. You have lost 5% of your body weight in six months. We know this is a disease. We know that if your appendicular lean mass is above 10, you have a very high amounts of muscle. But those are still nebulous terms to determine what is your optimal amount. We don't know those answers. Why muscle is so key when it comes to longevity. Yeah. Um, first, I want to say that it is the most underappreciated organ system in the body. And skeletal muscle is an endocrine organ. And it makes up 40% of the body weight. And as an endocrine organ, contracting skeletal muscle secretes myokines. And myokines are hormones that travel throughout the body and they interface with the brain, muscle, liver, all the systems. It, there's an interplay and crosstalk, the immune system everything. So skeletal muscle is this endocrine organ system that releases myokines. So that's one thing that skeletal muscle does. The other thing is as it relates to metabolism, it is the metabolic sink for glucose disposal. The carbohydrates that you eat, everybody is talking about insulin resistance, blood sugar levels, triglycerides. Skeletal muscle is really the hub for storage and utilization of these things. It is absolutely key. When someone gets injured, skeletal muscle is the amino acid reservoir. We are always going through protein turnover, whether it's gut, whether it's liver, whether it's hair, skin, and nails, anything. Skeletal muscle is, in a pinch, your amino acid reservoir. If you get sick, skeletal muscle. As it relates to body armor, if you fall, mobility, strength, those, that's kind of like the obvious. Skeletal muscle is really the key. And that's just a handful of things skeletal muscle is responsible for. And when it comes to the most fundamental of questions, which is if muscle is so good, yeah, what are the things that eat away at it? Yeah. And then what are the things that cause it to grow? Let's start off with- Yeah, I love that what question. Causes... What a great question. Drew, I'm coming back. I'm coming back for, I don't know, round four of this podcast. These are really, really great questions. When we think about- um, like, let's just think about healthy skeletal muscle first. The way that we think about healthy skeletal muscle is muscle that has flux. What do I mean by flux? Meaning if muscle is a suitcase and you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates and you're not exercising and your suitcase gets overstuffed, it becomes unhealthy and everything flows back into the bloodstream for simplicity's sake. Over time, when there's lack of flux, we don't just get body fat that we see subcutaneous fat, we also get fat infiltrated into skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle ends up looking like a marbled steak. This is unhealthy skeletal muscle. It has decreased strength, decreased metabolic capacity. Every function of muscle will decrease when it becomes unhealthy. In fact, if you look at some of the early work by Kit Peterson, you can see insulin resistance happening and health, unhealthy skeletal muscle by 18. And in fact, I mean, listen, I was just looking at some recent data between, I don't know, 2010 to 2017, there has been a 95% increase in people under the age of 20 having type 2 diabetes. And that data is from the CDC. That's insane. But where does that start? That doesn't start with obesity. It starts with skeletal muscle. The things that make unhealthy skeletal muscle are Number one, excess calories, excess food, processed food that really ends up in a bad place in skeletal muscle from overconsumption of calories and a decrease in flux and utilization. So it's this decrease in activity, which is just killer for skeletal muscle. And then over time, when we see muscle change, we see it changes, um, you know, skeletal muscle. The other thing I forgot to mention about skeletal muscle is it's a nutrient sensing organ. Skeletal muscle senses the quality of the diet as it relates to amino acids, and it becomes anabolically resistant, meaning the efficiency of amino acid sensing decreases. As we age, if we are eating lower protein diets, we have no way to from a nutritional standpoint to correct for that anabolic resistance. And the way in which one would do that would be to increase dietary protein. 
Um, and there's some really hallmark, there's a, a really hallmark paper. Um, I think Ketstanzos is his name. And it was in the early 2000s where he showed that younger, older muscle will, res will respond like younger muscle when protein is high enough. So anabolic resistance happens when skeletal muscle decreases its efficiency, meaning it is not as sensitive to dietary protein. And the listeners at home is going, oh, this is like so much science. And what does that really mean? It just means that skeletal muscle becomes very difficult to stimulate. And we see the end point of that when our parents age and they become sarcopenic and their muscles get smaller. We can all visually know, we all know what that looks like. And this is um, at you know, in part a byproduct of anabolic resistance. But when we look at some of the hallmark literature, you can address anabolic resistance by improving the efficiency of protein simply by increasing dietary protein at a meal so that that muscle responds like younger tissue. That's amazing. You know, you dedicated your book to your mentor. I know. Who you also introduced us to, and he was on this podcast, Dr. Donald Lehman. Yeah. We'll link to his episode in the show notes. One of the things that he talked about on the episode that we had him on is that when it came to stimulating muscle, he said that his percentage that he would give is about 75% comes from exercise and stimulating the muscle through resistance training or totally. strength training. Yeah. And 25% comes from the dietary protein that we have. Is that your understanding as well too? So Don and I have spoken about this often, and here's what I think. As a physician who sees patients, 100% of people eat. 50% of Americans exercise. In fact, 24% of Americans are meeting the daily requirements for exercise. So if I had to pick, I have to pick what everybody has to do, which is eat. We have to get that right. Is exercise a greater stimulus to skeletal muscle? Totally. But with 50% of Americans doing that and 20, only 24% actually meeting the requirements, we have to protect the muscle that individuals have. We have to. And if we don't do it through dietary means, which is the easiest lever to pull, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yes, skeletal muscle, exercising skeletal muscle the way in which it affects the homeostasis of the whole body, there's no greater influence. There is no greater influence. But with those statistics, we have to start where people are. And that is everybody's eating. And that's why you feel that you are so passionate about, you're passionate about the whole thing. Yeah. Right? Even when we met and you came on the podcast, you were like, look, we got to get you on a good workout program. I started one. I found a group out here called Ultimate Performance. I worked with them for almost yes, a year. Yes, sir. Now I'm working with a different trainer, but yeah. they were fantastic. And also a big part of what I did when I worked with them is, you know, they got my protein intake up. I had been in that place where I was kind of confused a lot about protein. You know, sitting in the seat, I get to interview a lot of people and I was hearing one person is saying this, another person saying that. And I'm just like, okay. And until I started tracking how much protein I was having, through your encouragement, I didn't realize how much I was under eating on protein. How much were you eating? I was probably estimate eating, because I would get very full on fat, healthy fats in my diet. I was probably eating, I went up to 140, 140 grams of protein a day. That's impressive but my, for you. But that's where I went up to that's once impressive I started. That's impressive for you, yes. And I pretty much stayed at that. That's great for Feel you. Feel great. Yes. And before I was probably on a daily basis because I wasn't tracking. So I have to estimate. And you have to track. And you have to track. So I think know. I was probably eating maybe less than a hundred. It probably was like 80 grams. And so when I went in for one of my first training sessions and I did a body composition uh, measurements, I also had just come back from Italy, but in general, I had built up a lifestyle where Sure, I play tennis. Sure, I go hiking every week, but I wasn't prioritizing resistance training and I wasn't eating enough protein. So I came in for my measurement after our interview and it was my 40th birthday. I spent a month in Italy. I, I measured in at 26% body fat. Drew. Which is, which is, Drew. people know me, I'm a thin guy. So I'm in the skinny fat category, which a lot of Indians and South Asians fall into. And then within about six months of prioritizing protein, and uh, working out on a consistent basis, I was doing about three three workouts, strength training down here at the local gym um, with Ultimate Performance. 
I got down to 14.5% body composition. That's I think incredible. at my lowest, I was like 13. And then I kind of was more focused on adding muscle mass from yeah. there. So I wasn't trying to get to like, you know, super low. I was just like, all right, I'm fine. So I think right now I'm probably like 15, 16%, but I'm just focusing on sort of adding lean muscle mass mm. because my, my audience knows this, grew up primarily vegetarian, you know, under eight on protein, didn't really prioritize working out primarily because I would work out and I would feel like I didn't really see the results, but I wasn't really prioritizing even protein when I was vegetarian either. So then I was like, all right, I guess that I'm just going to be this way. I'm just going to be thin. And that's just kind of what I'm going to do. Let me focus on my good hair and my looks instead. I'm not really going to have muscles. And then I got serious about it after our conversation and things have been going great. I added, uh, I added about 10 pounds of lean muscle mass. True. Nine, this is the nine first point... I'm hearing about it. We are not friends anymore. I cannot believe this is the first time hearing about it. That's incredible. I added, it was not, it was like, okay, it's not exactly 10. My last measurement came in at, I think it was 8.9. And since that time, I've, I've estimated, I haven't gone back in for my uh, in-body scan. The estimate is I've gotten about an additional pound of muscle mass since then. So yeah, let's say like, let's call it like 8.9 to 10, somewhere about that. And it took me about a year to do that of consistent training and working out. And, you know, now I'm just fighting to continue to grow that, um, every month. So that's the update on my end. That's Since the amazing. Last time that we had you here in the I'm studio. so excited. Hey guys, are you hearing that? That's pretty <laughs> incredible. That's incredible. It's incredible to see change and it's incredible to see where you came from and that it's always possible. It is never too late to be forever strong ever. In fact, I was looking at older data for, um, even very old individuals upwards of 75, they can still get stronger and put on muscle. Yeah. I saw on Instagram the other day, I saw like a 90 year old man, like deadlifting weights. And I think the thing is that we have all these preconceived notions about letting, what getting That's older exactly means. Right. That's exactly right. So talk about them. You know, what are some of the preconceived notions that people have about getting older? This is, this is body? probably one of the biggest struggles because how do we create a movement where we can really shift people's perspective that it's a non-negotiable to train? And how do we do that? And I don't know that answer, but I sure as heck I'm going to try. Oftentimes, what people think aging has to be is that they are too busy, their metabolism has changed, this is just the way they're going to be, and there's nothing that they can do. And they watch their parents age, and you watch X, Y, and Z. The older generation is not accustomed to training. It's just not. And so because of that, large populations, we're looking at when we say this is a healthy older individual who is sedentary, I would argue and say there's no such thing. There is absolutely no such thing. And Who's arguing for that, by the way? Do people say that? I mean, people will say, well- Oh, I mean, like if you go to your doctor's office yeah. and say, they tell you, they do your blood work totally. and everything, they weigh you, they're totally. like, okay, you're healthy, just come back next year. No, But hybrid. if that person is sedentary, they're not actually They're not healthy. healthy. What and would be some of the markers that you would be running to show that they are not healthy? You will see- and again, it depends on the person, but you will see uh, elevated levels of insulin, elevated levels of blood glucose, elevated levels of triglycerides. But the thing is, skeletal muscle insulin resistance can happen before you have any markers. And I believe it's one of the root causes of, di of obesity. Again, obesity is complex, but really insulin resistance in skeletal muscle can begin before you're seeing outward signs. And so you have, and that's what people fail to understand is that we do actually have to routinely be testing strength and muscle mass as part of a vital sign, but it's not routinely done. You might get your BMI measured or your body fat, but again, and I, I put some, um, I put a um, chart in the book that shows skeletal muscle, but these, that's just based on a, a whole bunch of great data. But these charts don't exist of where, Drew, we don't know what your optimal muscle mass should be. Hmm. We don't know. How do we not know that? In fact, we don't even routinely directly measure skeletal muscle mass. What's the best way to measure it, by the way? I think the best way, so the best way imaging wise would be a CT or MRI because, um, you know, on an MRI, you'll also see fat infiltration. A MRI or CT is not something that people can do. What they're going to start doing, which is being done in research, which I believe is going to hopefully come to fruition in the next five years, will be a D3 creatine. So it's a labeled creatine. People will take a pill and creatine exists in skeletal muscle and you'll be able to measure it in your urine. 
and that will give you a direct measure of skeletal muscle mass. What's the next best thing that is available to people today? So now we have a DEXA or an in-body, those kind of bioimpedance. And just to clear the air, you know, I think we had one guest previously who misspoke and said DEXA isn't radiation, but it is radiation, right? You shouldn't Low do it mo- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Low you doses. shouldn't do it more than like once a year? No, you can do it more than once okay, a year. Got but it. Uh, I mean, it's a low dose radiation, but yes. Okay, got it. Yeah. And then from there is in body. Yeah, in body. And there's other ways to in look. body scan. Yeah, that's which a okay. lot of gyms have. Yep. You can go online. You can search, and you totally. can find places around you. Yep. Um, and then a waist to hip ratio, mm-hmm. so measuring kind of what your circumference is and those kinds of things. But you know, overall, we're not as advanced as we should be. Mm-hmm. We're just not, because again, it's been kind of this. I don't know, hiding in plain sight, this organ of longevity is this key and pinnacle to muscle as the center of the universe, as silly as that sounds. Well, with the access that we have now until this new yeah, yeah, methodologies yeah. come, so let's say somebody gets a DEXA or gets an in-body scan, yep. what are some of the key things that they're looking at to determine whether or not, am I healthy or am I not So healthy? visceral fat is a really big deal. Okay. Visceral fat, the lower, the better. The lower visceral fat, the better. You know, and arguably the lower um, body fat, the better, within within reason. Within reason. I mean, yeah. typically women are going to be higher body fat percentage. What is, the op- what, is the, what is a good range? Great question. Let's start I, off with women and then I, we'll talk yeah. about men. You know what? I would say that they will... Me- they will mention, you know, the statistics will be like, okay, well, 30% body fat is is a bit too high for anybody, men or women. I would argue that the body fat percentages that we are measuring are too high in general. Mm-hmm. So if you are someone who is athletic, they'll say, okay, well, you could be anywhere from 12 to 15 to 20% body fat. Where in that range would be optimal? And I think that that is variable for anybody. But generally, you would say like, for a man, somewhere around like 12 to 15% is, is going to be healthy. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that would be great for a man. Or Wait. even lower, right? So they could be even lower than that. Uh-huh. So Drew, next time I come on this podcast, man, you're going to have to step up your game. Well, I'm actually <laughs> sort of working with a trainer. Yeah. And so because I'm trying to add, there's definitely what I've been told yeah. is there's going to be some fat along the way and mm-hmm. then I can cut later on. That's right. Is that accurate? That's right. And so for you, I would say if we were to think about designing a plan, we would understand what your baseline calories are and then we'd increase that by 10 to 20%. Mm-hmm. Because we don't we want to put on muscle mass, but we don't want to put on you too much fat. don't want to add fat, fat too quickly. That's right. right. And then for women, we should mention women in terms of how much body fat percent. You know, again, I, I, I really struggle with these numbers because we do know that you know, a certain amount of body fat percentage will create low-grade inflammation. The question isn't how high they can go. In my mind, the question is how low can you go, right? How, what is the lowest kind of percentage of body fat that we can push that maybe we begin to rethink the framework of how we're thinking about things? Mm -hmm. What are some, so it sounds like you have a little bit of like your own scale, which is optimal, but generally... For women, is there a body fat percentage where you start to feel with your patients in Mm -hmm. your experience where it's like, hey, we have to address this because putting optimal aside, we know that the body's not going to do as well above this body fat percentage, right? Like let's go out of optimal and let's talk about like generally people shooting for like a healthier body fat because you can also have some – like can there be healthier people that are at a higher body fat percentage? I think that there can, there can be, and I think that there would be evidence in the literature. But again, um, I, I say that cautiously. Can there be people with higher body fat percentage that are metabolically healthy? Yes. My question is, what does the health of their muscle look like? Mm-hmm. And again, we don't have quite the tools that are routine to be able to look at the tissue itself yet. Ultrasound and those things, it's just not, it's not routine care. Got it. Um, I, I certainly would like to see women, you know, t- maybe 22%. I would be happy with 22% body fat if I had to give a number. Um, I would be happy with it even a little bit lower. Okay, um, great. And if I were to say, what am I seeing when women go higher? Again, it, it depends on the woman because some women are genetically leaner. For example, the women in my family are just a leaner group. So for them, let's say 15% is where they live naturally without doing anything. And then they gain uh, 5% body fat, and it's still only 20%, but they may start to see some metabolic abnormalities. 
What is an example of that? Elevated blood sugar. Elevated blood sugar. Elevated HSCRP. A little inflammation going on. So that's, that's an example. Yeah. yeah. And, and obviously when it comes to body composition, like you, as a medical doctor, you are looking at all these things in context, right? Like you're yeah. looking at body composition, body fat percentage, but you're also looking at people's labs. Mm -hmm. And then you're also looking at their performance as well. Their strength. Their yeah. strength. Yep. And how are you measuring strength? Well, we work with fitness professionals to determine, you know, where these people are at as it relates to squat, deadlift, you know, what are they doing for physical activity? All, you know, the, et cetera, all the things. Right. And, and what are some of the key things that you're looking for to know that they're heading in the right direction? We want to Even see, on a basic level. Yeah, so, so for the people that are listening today who may go to the gym occasionally, but they don't have a consistent program, what are some of the core things you're looking at? Like, hey, look, this is a good first baseline. First baseline is knowing where you're at. Knowing what, and again, people should, I, I highly strongly, highly and strongly, if those two things can be combined, recommend working with a trainer or a fitness professional. If it if they are not able to do that, then there's lots of online options, but really having someone cue you to do certain things. Like this is, we are so domesticated as a species physically. We were not designed to be as sedentary as we are. You have to get moving. And when you are thinking about where your baseline is, you should know how long it's going to take you to go a mile, right? How fast are you going to run a mile if you don't run? How fast are you going to bike or row? Some kind of um, something that there is some crossover. How long is it going to take you? You should know how many push-ups you're going to be able to do. You should know how many pull-ups you're going to be able to do. You should know how many sit-ups you can do. Just basic standard. And then more advanced, how much can you squat? What does that compound movement look like? How much can you deadlift? Exercise physiology is a science in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I am not an exercise physiologist. So for my practice, we have those individuals that will make a program for an individual. What I will do is I'll provide you with some general, very basic guidelines sure. that I, I think would be beneficial and usable for your listener. Number one, ev with all this talk about muscle, People are going to think, oh, well, there's all this talk about muscle. Is cardio any good? And I would say cardio is absolutely important and a great base to start with. Cardiovascular activity is really good for mitochondria function, which is the powerhouses of the cell, which is really important for energy. Overall energy, feeling very vibrant. It's really good for blood flow. Also, you know, we talked about muscle as an endocrine organ. Muscle, when you contract it, it secretes myokines. And myokines are proteins that travel throughout the body that have different impacts on different organs. So they act locally. They act in a autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine nature, which is fascinating to think that the benefit beyond exercise is not just the activity for cardiovascular health. So I say cardiovascular activity, and I pinpoint cardiovascular health and mitochondria function, but that exercising muscle does so much more. The contracting skeletal muscle actually also interfaces with the immune system. And I know that I'm getting a little bit off track, but I think understanding the why is so important. If we provide them the why, then the execution becomes easier. So if we can shift the perspective that when an individual is getting a baseline of physical activity, that that exercising muscle is doing so much more than feeling good and training and getting strong, but you're actually contracting this tissue, which is having a hormonal effect on the whole body through these this interface of these myokines. It is fighting and balancing inflammation. And it is augmenting immunity. And we are hearing a lot about cytokines. You've heard about TNF-alpha. Um, cells of the immune system produce inflammatory cytokines. And exercise in and of itself has a counter-regulatory nature. So exercise and muscle secretes myokines like interleukin-6 and interfaces has like a yin-yang yang effect and dampens down inflammation, which that's amazing. So if you're worried about inflammation and you're worried about an out of control immune system, 
one thing that an individual can do is to start exercising. Um, so that's fascinating. Now, is there any consideration, you know, a lot of my friends that have been yeah. the longest, uh, including my brother-in-law, who's a cardiologist and everything, who's into like functional medicine. Um, is there also a component of people who rigorously exercise yeah. the injury piece? For sure. You know, I don't know anybody <laughs> that isn't like uh, yeah. five to 10 years into their sort of exercise yeah. regimen that hasn't had to deal with some sort of like serious injury component in yeah. some direction. I think that I think it's an interesting concept. And again, number one, it's it's likely humans in general. We don't have the same movement patterns. We are sitting, we're doing things unnatural. I was joking with you before that I needed a booster chair for this, right? So I'm kind of in an unnatural position. So this is there is natural wear and tear. Um and that is a component to it. Right. And that being said, though, you're either going to wear out or rust out. So you and, might as well wear out. And there is a whole movement yeah. of workout programs. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of one here in Los Angeles that yeah. just started called Functional Patterns. Cool. They're way more about getting you to move as you naturally did, yep. which also includes having you breathe in a way that's more there. And then there's a lot of uh, different workout type things like primal movements yeah. that are less about isolated weights in very specific categories yeah. on isolated muscles, but more getting you to do things like we would have done on our hunter-gatherer days. Yes. And and I will say from a baseline perspective, getting in, the recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity, yeah. which, okay. And then I would also layer on three to four days of resistance exercise. And mm -hmm. starting with hypertrophy is a great place to start. Hypertrophy, you know, they say it's whether it's eight to 12 to 15 reps, the muscle doesn't go, oh my gosh, you've hit 15, I'm going to grow now. But really hypertrophy training is based on volume, very hard to mess up, uh, especially if an individual is untrained. Um, so I think that hypertrophy training, which is again, resistance exercise three to four days a week, going to a higher perceived exertion, they should be working hard. It is not about going and lifting 15 pounds. Again, it is going and doing and lifting to fatigue. It's really effort. It's yeah. effortful. Another thing that I think is really inc important to incorporate once a week and depending on a training age, is high intensity interval training. And that is really going to a max out effort for a defined period of time. Mm -hmm. For the person Anybody. that's- Anybody. Yeah, for the person that's, you know, maybe has very limited movement, mm -hmm. right? Even, you know, focusing on as a first step that 150 hours, sorry, yeah, 150, 150 minutes. 150 hours 150 would be, hours would be My crazy. husband might do that. <laughs> yeah, not even enough time in the week. 150 <laughs> right. minutes of getting in that rigorous yeah. activity a week, right? Mm -hmm. Couple low-hanging fruit ways to achieve that, yeah. that you feel. Um, well, it depends. So you're saying for someone who's not very mobile. Right, right. Let's that, start off with that yeah. individual. So that would be just walking. That would be doing walking. any kind of movement because for them, that may be where they need to build their base. Mm -hmm. And again, high-intensity training could be sitting and standing out of a chair. Yeah. You do that enough times, it's actually very difficult. <laughs> and for someone who is untrained or has gone through lockdown and COVID and not been able to get to the gym, those kinds of things can be very valuable. Yeah. Um, that would be a great and easy place to start. And I know it's it might sound trivial, but again, we know that the more activity individuals do, the better off they're going to be. Yeah, we did a whole uh, little mini episode on walking and how just simply walking more, which again, we have people of all different ages and backgrounds, but that's a great place yeah. to start. You'll improve your metabolic health. You will. It's a good way to, you know, you incorporate all the aspects that were built into the process of EMDR, mm. right? And a sense of oh, cool. having perspective in your life. Mm. Uh, it's a great way to connect with family, friends, social, loved ones. So it's an easy lift and it's a great place to get started. Yeah. And there's an interest, and this is funny, no pun intended, there's the Drew study. <laughs> that came out and there you know there are some issues with the study but it it focused on walking and movement and it showed that those individuals who walked more actually had lower white blood cell and that was good in terms of you don't want your white blood cells to be high that right. can be an issue but it it was in a more optimal range for individuals so it was a way of looking at is that exercise prescription impacting individuals let's go back because you mentioned you know in the context of uh you know diet and we're kind of jumping back and forth here you mentioned that you were vegetarian at one point. I in time. was. Give us in the college. history of that. What was the motivation? Yeah, I um 
again, you know, it's interesting. I, I come out and, and I have these conversations about being and feeling that animal-based protein is very important. And it's it comes from a place of experience, but that doesn't mean that I am anti-vegetarian. And in fact, I was vegetarian for many years in college. And do you have maybe now some vegetarian patients? I do, of course, and yeah. vegetarian friends. Yeah. Right? Or vegan. Yeah, or vegan friends. It Again, it shouldn't be a dividing component. It really, again, health is individual and there are ways in which we unify it. I was not able to maintain my training. At one point in my life, I was very physically fit and I just could not keep up with recovery and injury and my iron levels were low. I, what was the first sign for you, looking back now at the time, that you were not able to keep up with your training or maybe this diet that you thought was doing great or maybe even worked. I was hungry well. all the time. Okay. I was hungry. I was. I could not stop thinking about food. Mm -hmm. I was having a lot of feet, leg pain. I was iron deficient. Mm -hmm. um, I was just really struggling. My gums started bleeding. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. And what was your original motivation in the first place? Because I really liked animals. Yeah. It was, very, it was more of an emotional, spiritual decision for me. Mm -hmm. And I cried the first time I had chicken. I was, you know, Liz Lipsky is my godmother. Mm. You know Liz, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So I, um, I graduated high school early and I moved in with her. And I was vegetarian at the time. And I remember I called her and I was just crying because I, I started with chicken. And I actually had felt exponentially better once I started to incorporate more animal proteins. But that, that is my story. Do you think quality of the animal proteins that we eat matters? And additionally, there's this conversation that's happening mm. today more so than ever, which is, well, we're not even really eating animals in the way that we previously once did. Mm. Why just focusing on what do you mean? the muscle oh, you component mean they and not eating... It. You know, whether it's nose to tail or organ meats yeah. or other stuff like that. Any thoughts on either one of those two? Um, quality first. Let's talk about that. Okay. Quality, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're defining quality as... So let's talk about it from each of the Great. common proteins that are out there. So let's talk about chicken. That was the first thing you okay. had. Okay. A lot of chicken these days, primarily fed on corn mm. and other things like that. People have come on this podcast before. Uh, whether it's a Dr. Gundry type person mm. or somebody else who is okay with people having, you know, some animal proteins and says, you know, when we can, we want to be steering in the direction towards having, you know, not the high omega-6, um, you know, chicken that's out there and instead having, you know, uh, pasture raised. Um, uh, so any thoughts on, on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I would say, are the majority of omega-6s coming from chicken or are they coming from other processed foods and processed fats? Mm -hmm. So that, that would be the first question I would so ask. So total, if somebody did an omega index, which is yeah. you know a great yeah. test, mm -hmm. yeah, no affiliation. We, we, that's but, uh, right. We that's, use that all the time. Uh -huh. That test I actually was a big part of me okay. uh, starting to incorporate fish in my diet because okay. my omega-6 to omega-3 uh, ratio was out of whack. I've written about this and talked about it before on the podcast. So if their omega index was out of whack based on the ideal right. ranges that have out mm. there, you would first say, let's look at the processed food that you're eating. I would. I Not would. necessarily the animal products, which right. even if they're a little bit higher. Right. Because so the, the question is what, again, if we're looking at a health endpoint, how much chicken is it going to take to raise that omega-6? Mm -hmm. How much dietary chicken would you Do we you know the to answer to that? I right don't. Now? I okay. don't. But I think that the, the question would be before we say, I'm only going to eat pasture raised. So I'm of the philosophy that high quality protein comes first, mm -hmm. no matter where you get it. And people may or may not, you know, totally disagree with me, but I would much rather eat high quality protein, whether it is conventional or organic, than I would be eating some other kind of processed food. Mm -hmm. Because protein is really important. The question becomes, if the chicken is fed corn, well, okay, I need to see some evidence that that chicken breast is going to raise my omega-6 index. Mm -hmm. I, I just I just don't know if, you know, what kind of dosing we're talking about. And because I advocate for high quality protein, I'm very careful about how I 
were to think about something like that, right? How I would, because those kinds of recommendations make and impact people, right? Not because as accessible, exactly, prices up. exactly. So then, why I think that's very dangerous to say to someone, "Don't eat chicken because it's going to increase your omega six index or your omega six ratio." And I would say, well, the majority of that is probably coming from processed foods, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, if seed oils are a problem, but really it's likely excess calories and excess processed foods. So that would be one part. The other part is, you know, beef, whether it's conventionally raised beef versus um, organic beef, there is some new evidence to support that there is higher amounts of omega-3s in um, grass-fed beef, which makes sense. In terms of conventionally, well, number one, are we eating beef to get your omegas? I'm not really sure. Right. It's still quite low compared to, right. to fish. Exactly. So this becomes an important conversation in terms of arguments that we'd be making as to why or why not we would do organic or not. Um, in terms of conventionally raised animals, they spend the majority of their life. And first of all, there's 750,000 ranchers and there's a thousand conventional beef entities, whatever that is. So the majority of the beef that we get, rather, whether it is conventional or organic, come from ranchers, which is interesting. When we think about conventional, they spend two thirds of their life grazing in pasture. And then they go to a feedlot to be fed corn or, or their corn finished. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I do think that there's a lot of misinformation about the practices of these, you know, um, animal husbandry or cattle raising. And ultimately, I believe whether you get your quality protein from conventional or organic, me personally, I prefer organic. I think regenerative agriculture is very beneficial. And I'm sure that your listener would also agree, but that wouldn't be a barrier to entry for me. And, uh, it wouldn't be a conversation with you if we didn't touch on some of the stuff and the conversations around climate change okay. and people's focus on that. Yeah. Give us your high level take <laughs> when people yeah. talk about uh, animal protein of course. being a big driver of that. I think that there is a lot of narrative and a lot of bias out there. And when we think about climate change in the US, we're thinking about fossil fuel, industry and electricity. So you're looking at 80 some percent is coming from that. 80 some percent is coming from industry. And population-based things like electricity and travel. Out of all of that, out of 100% of you know, the contribution to climate change, we're looking at 9% is agriculture, which includes vegetables and fruits and grains and cattle and dairy. Of that 9%, 3% is animal-based products, whether it's cattle or dairy. The rest is vegetables, fruits, and, and grains, and things of that nature. So if we care about climate change, how is it that we are scapegoating cattle, which by the way, it's not this black and white picture, right? Our red meat consumption is down 30% since 1975. We utilize cattle and then they grow. It's not, we're not having an exponential burst of herds. You know, you're talking about something relatively stable. Where we can really have an impact is if you live in, I don't know, Alaska, then you shouldn't be eating your avocados. That has to travel, transportation, right? I also think that we must understand that marginal land is cannot. So if we have, and I got this from Frank, Frank Mitlahunter. Have you heard of Frank Mitlahunter? No, I haven't. If we had a, a piece of paper, I'll just give you the visual. So Frank Mitlahunter is from UC Davis, and he is a world expert in climate change. This is what he does. So it's always great to hear a world expert weigh in on matters of climate change. So he explained it this way. He said, imagine a sheet of paper. This is all the world, this one sheet of paper. And now fold this into a postcard size. Okay, so you fold it into a postcard size. Postcard size. He said, this is the inhabitable, this is like the land mass. Okay, so we went from a eight by 10 to a postcard size. This is a land mass. Now he pulls out a business card and he said, okay, well, here is the business card. And this is the farm. This is, this is the land in which we can create on. 
he cut it from one third to two thirds. And he said, this two thirds is marginal land. You can do nothing but graze cattle on this land or graze ruminants. I shouldn't even say cattle. Is this grazing? And one third is our farming land. So that is a visual of what we are looking at. We're talking about one third of this land mass, right? And saying, okay, well, what are we going to do with that marginal land? The idea that we would eliminate all cattle because cattle or ruminants are contributing in some massive amount to climate change is incorrect. And the data would support that we are looking at industry, electricity, and transportation. Food waste is much more impactful than cattle. The majority of individuals waste food that has to go to landfill. It has to decompose. It's like the estimates are like 40% of food is waste. Well, so perhaps rather than scapegoating something else, which is very interesting that that becomes the target, right? It doesn't totally logically make sense. Again, this goes back to a theme that I believe to be true is we must have transparent conversations. So if the evidence doesn't support that ruminants are the root of all evil, why is it constantly being brought up? Who profits from this? Because it's not the consumer. It's not someone who's driving towards health. In fact, what's happening is they're getting very mixed messages. And I believe a lot of them, you know, you were vegetarian at one point in time. You're probably telling other people that that was the right thing to do. Right. Maybe, maybe not. Mine was more like, yeah. I grew up that way. Right. But I was vegan for a little while as well, too. And I really thought that I had the answer. Yeah. Right? It worked great for a long time. You know, it worked great for a long time. And then until I didn't feel good. Yeah. My thing was, you know, I wasn't training hard like you were, but um, I started incorporating fish in my diet first because I got into functional medicine. I started running the labs. I did the Omega Quant test and I saw, mm. okay, for me, this is out of whack a little right. bit. And I think that that's the part that I'm really excited about because honestly, like I'm in this space, but I'm not a physician. I'm just kind of like a professional amateur, mm -hmm. right? I know enough to ask what questions, yeah. but even there's times where I feel confused. Yeah. De genuinely. Mm. But the things that I'm trying to really focus in on, because I know that my diet will continue to shift, mm. there'll be things and experiments that I run, is that I'm, to the best extent, not everything can be seen through blood work or scans right. or other stuff. But if I at least put a watch on that, I can do different experiments. Mm. For a while, I was having a lot of added saturated fat in my diet. And that personally didn't work very well. That probably well for me, I could see right? that not not being that ideal didn't work for, for me. Yeah. Threw my lipids off, right. and also got a little bit of like an endotoxemia type okay. reaction. My gut got messed up. Fixed that. Mm. Felt great. Right. Mm. Was still able to keep high quality animal protein in the yeah. diet. You know, there were some things that I re removed out of the added saturated fats that were there, and. I was able to both catch it because I felt some symptoms, but okay. a lot of times, you know, you don't feel things right away and it's a slow bubbling of like the frog in the water, but having access to like blood work and looking at things right. at least feels like, okay, I can try different experiments. I can see, yeah. see how I feel, but let me just look at some of the basics yeah. and see if I'm on the right track or not on the right track. Yeah. And I also think that it's an evolving, like you said, it's an evolving experiment and it depends on the season. It depends on the goal at the time, right. right? Are you trying to grow? Are you trying to go through a fasting period? Like, What is the goal? And the human body is very adaptable, yes. which is why we do see some people do phenomenal on a vegetarian style diet. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there are some reasons why to the reason as to why that is, uh, which is some of the newer science in terms of might change everything that we know about uh, protein metabolism. Talk about it. Can yeah. you do a little preview? Mm, sure. So this is these are only proof of concepts, but there is some data coming out that the individuals that are eating a very high fiber diet are able to scavenge and generate the bugs in their belly, some of the essential amino acids. That's interesting. It's Amazing. It's fascinating. If it pans out to if be If it correct. pans out and 
essentially their gut is looking more like a ruminant's gut. A ruminant, you know, a cow is an upcycler of nutrients. So it takes low quality proteins and is able to upcycle into a higher quality protein. And when you're looking at these proof of concept yeah. again, super, yeah. early, super early, what is it, uh, you know, amount of fiber that they're looking at inside of the study? Yeah. Well, again, these are, these are rodent models, but mm -hmm. um, I hate to give a number. Um, okay. Got I, it. I would hate to give a number because yeah. it would be translatable and I don't want right. to give you wrong information, but um, Don Lehman was a, a part of that study. It'll be interesting to see as that translates to humans. I think that that's very real. I do think that we are going to find out that some individuals have the capacity to generate through their gut microbiome essential amino acids. Now, is that going to be enough for optimization? Probably not. And it will probably be uh, more of an eight week period. So an individual can go through eight weeks of perhaps a lower protein diet. Again, this is all speculation, but I, I do think that that's important. And it's gonna be interesting to see how that pans out. I think what we're ultimately going to look at and what will ultimately be ideal for the human is cyclical, hmm. is cyclical nutrition. Because we generally came out of seasons? No, I believe, and again, this is my speculation. Yeah, these are just your yeah, I believe, stuff out. I believe that optimizing for protein, so in my clinic, I recommend one gram per pound ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm 115 pounds, maybe 120 pounds, I eat 120 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. For you, whatever your and weight. You try to get a good chunk of that. Yeah, in, in, the in divided meals. meals. I don't snack. I tend to, you know, I'll do two meals and a snack, or not a snack, a smaller meal, but I, mm -hmm. I try to divide that up. Again, that's not a ton of protein. Um, and then the idea is I believe, so there's something called this integrated stress response where when you take away the essential amino acids to the body, the body goes through this process of autophagy. And I'm not an expert in autophagy, but it's really the upregulation and removing the damaged cells. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there is some benefit to upregulating this system. And it's, it's really a methionine restriction, which is essentially what Walter Longo is talking about. But I believe that Walter Longo is talking about it uh, indefinitely for all people at all times, except if they're older. I don't agree with that. I think the benefits are eating to optimize skeletal muscle for the majority of the time. And if an individual will go through, say, one week every three months of a methionine restriction, which is unbalancing those amino acids, which creates this integrated stress response based on methionine restriction, which would be a largely plant-based vegan diet for a couple days every three months, I think that that will likely be a sweet spot. Hmm. And again, I have no data to prove this, but based on the trends that I've been seeing, seeing with my patients and just putting it all together makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, that'll be good to follow and yeah. see because every year it seems like we learn more yeah. and more components. The other thing that I think about is that, again, as you've mentioned, you know, if we get people to sleep better, hmm. if we get these minimums, which for the vast amount of population for movement those 150 minutes is not even close, right? Right. If we remove our ultra processed foods, right? Already, we're like at, we're like ahead of the game. Ahead of the game, yeah. Right. So yeah. just anybody who's listening yeah. that feels like, oh my gosh, I'm so confused. I don't even know yeah. where to start because I just heard another podcast and they came here. It's just so important to realize like you're yeah. already so ahead of the game. Largely, mm. a lot of these conversations we're talking about here. And you'll hear sometimes both sides of the equation say, we don't have the exact study that I would like to see that proves this or that or whatever it might be. Even I though would there's not a lot... argue that for protein though. Oh, you no, know, you've it. mentioned that there's a lot of really great data on protein, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. There's not maybe the longevity data that some of the people are looking for, right? Following periods for long, following but individuals for longer periods of time. So, yes, but, though, but we do, so yes, it is very difficult to do longevity studies if not nearly impossible because those are in essence going to be lower quality data, right? It just is that way. But we can take aging individuals and look at them independently. Mm -hmm. And though that data is very important. So there are- Tons there, of There's data on older people yes. who have a higher percentage of yes. muscle mass as uh, just a- Higher as, protein, um, 
improved grip strength, all of these endpoints. Um, and, you know, there's ways in which you can do muscle biopsies and you look at the tissue. There's, we do have high quality studies on older individuals. And it doesn't mean that we've tracked them over time because, again, randomized controlled trials are different than sure. observational data. Got it. Got it. So going back to what I was sharing before, yeah. and thank you for that clarification. Um, you know, there's so much, but largely these conversations that we're in in this very specific yeah. world, would it be fair to say, like, this is really talking about optimal, right? Yeah. This yes. is really talking about optimal. Yes, we are talking about optimal living. And, you know, I I truly believe that if we provide clarity, and I really do feel that if an individual optimizes for protein, everything else falls into place. Again, and the reason I believe this, because it is solution oriented. Skeletal muscle is solution. And especially you and I believe in root cause. The root cause for these diseases is not adiposity, that's symptomology. Where does that come from? It comes from defects in the skeletal muscle from the place of glucose disposal, from the place where calories go that generate this adiposity. So if we believe that root cause medicine is real, then we have to believe in skeletal muscle. The way and the mechanism for how we protect and optimize skeletal muscle, especially as we age, is we must optimize for protein. And to me, that's a non-negotiable. Right now, the NHANES data would suggest that we are 70% plant-based. Right now, whether it's processed foods, added fats, added sugars, we are 70% plant-based. So we've tried this, the, you know, 18. And most people, it's funny because most people would say, they look at the world and they say, we're not, but right? We but, are. We are, but we but are based on the production yeah. value of the food. Yeah. And we are. And this is not, again, this is, I'm not making this up. This is. And it's primarily because of ultra processed foods. It is. The majority right? of. Chips, yes. you know, uh, fries, French fries, everything. Yes, pizza. Yes. So is that kind of by calories or by volume? That's a really good question. I believe it's by calories. Okay, so based on our total calories, actually most people 70 are getting- 70% of our calories are plant-based. Got it. Of that 30%, uh, the rest 30% is animal-based foods where we get the majority of all of our protein, all of our calcium, all of our iron, all of our zinc. And again, the goal is what are things that a listener could do to take away and if you build the house correctly, which is you build the house of muscle, you avoid the midlife muscle crisis, which seems to happen to people, you have to optimize for protein. And I will say, I feel so, and you've known me for years, I have not changed this message. No, it's been the same message from day one. It is that important. It is that important. It is underrepresented. We are missing the mark. The paradigm of thinking is backwards. We are completely focused on adiposity. And the way in which we can solve for this, if we change it to a more empowered view, we optimize for skeletal muscle. And the mechanism by which we do that is understanding our protein needs. We put in place protein. We understand on a very fundamental level that animal-based protein is different than plant-based protein. It is not an emotional conversation. These are based on amino acid numbers. This is just what it is. It's not saying that, I, you know, we're taking the emotion out of it. It is absolutely essential to meet an amino acid threshold need for a meal distribution to protect tissue. The majority of your listeners are women. They are either perimenopausal or postmenopausal, this is the time for them to not be confused because that window for flexibility and mistakes closes. This is the time that you do have to optimize for protein. It is the one thing that will help this idea of longevity. It is will It will help survivability. It will help blood sugar regulation. It will help fatty acid metabolism. You, if you cannot protect your skeletal muscle, you're constantly going to be chasing your table, tail. You will constantly be confused. So I hope- and also, I just want to add in one more thing. Yeah. You know, my, when my mom got diagnosed with breast cancer, she's doing great today, Amazing. By the way. She had Amazing. an incredible team around her, functional medicine doctors and other stuff that she started working mm. with. On a practical level, increasing her protein. And in the case of breast cancer, you know, they wanted to have her having higher quality fats because- 
some of, and I know there might be some confusion mm. here, so I know we're getting towards the end, but it would be good for you to, you know, yeah. to toss in your thoughts. If somebody has active cancer, they do believe through the angiogenesis process yeah. that cancer can leverage um, protein and sugar as two of its main sources of fuel for growth. So they wanted her a little bit higher fat until the cancer was, you know, subdued and she mm. was in the clear and then even ramped up her protein even further yeah. afterwards. But they immediately switched her off of a lot of the animal, uh, uh, sorry, plant proteins that yes, were there and getting sure. her to incorporate fish yeah. because on a practical level, she just was craving other foods way less. Yeah. I think you bring up a really good point. And active cancer is a whole other ball game. Now, number one, there is some good data to support a ketogenic or higher fat diet in relation to cancer. As it relates to protein and cancer, I don't know the answer because I feel very mixed. And I would leave this to the oncologist and those in that expertise because number one, cancer is a very highly catabolic state and there is a destruction of skeletal muscle. And when skeletal muscle is destroyed, depending on the kind of cancer, it becomes very difficult to survive. That being said, is protein, you know, it, through its stimulation, a growth promoter? Yeah, it is. But if we're yeah. following all your recommendations way ahead of time, hopefully, knock on wood for everybody who's listening, yeah. we are less likely because most cancers, you know, are, the vast majority yeah. are lifestyle driven mm. and sugar fuels cancer. Uh, uh, well, really, adiposity is one of the biggest risk factors. Right. Being overweight, being over fat is one of the biggest risk factors. Right. So hopefully, knock on wood yes. again, that nobody ends up finding themselves in that situation. Right. If you do, again, surround yourself with a team and you can come up with the right personal decision for yeah. you. But I felt I snapped you out of, I just had a question because yeah. personally, I was very interested in that topic. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I know a lot of people that are have cancer and are kind of mm. going through that process. But you were so eloquently in the final stages of giving us your sort of core thesis <laughs> of why this matters. And I want to yeah. set you up for that again. Yeah. You know, for the folks that are listening here, you know, you have that limited window of time do, period to really set the foundation. And this is why you're driven by the work and the mission that you're yes. driven by. Don't miss it. Do not miss the opportunity by the noise and the confusion. We have very high quality evidence over half of a century of data to support the impact of muscle. This is the ultimate in strong medicine, truly. And if people really care about longevity and being able to function at a high capacity, you have to care about your muscle. That needs to be the focus. Dietary protein is the vehicle. And of course, exercise, resistance training, these things that may not come natural to people are actually a non-negotiable. What percentage, if you balance it out, because it's both of those, right? It's mm -hmm. the working out and the resistance yes. training, and it's the added in high quality protein. I hate to pick, but training stimulus will likely impact you more. But I, I would hate to pick, right? Because you can't really do one without the other. Sure. But a training stimulus is likely more impactful. And it's, I think it's important for people to hear that because that's how, number one, it's how you honestly feel. But yeah. number two is that even if you have your own feelings and thoughts about it, right? But yeah. you agree with the core sentiment. So let's yeah. say you prefer to be vegetarian, you prefer to be vegan, you prefer to, you know, have less protein, whatever. Fine. 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 But do not miss out on the core message, which is there's so much data showing yeah. that muscle is one of the keys to longevity. Yeah. So how are you going to get that muscle, especially as you age, if you're not eating that protein and you're not working out? you're rolling the dice in terms of like, what's gonna happen to you next. You are, and it, it becomes really important to understand again that that window closes, that the, you have to act before you are motivated to do it. And oftentimes we cannot use information overload as a distraction. And that happens and it doesn't need to. There's a cohort of people, even though a lot of people have made progress, there's a cohort of people who are like, okay, I can't even do one pull up, I can't, maybe I can do a couple push-ups on my knees. I haven't tried a squat recently, even though I know kind of what it looks like. Am I doomed? What never, do you want to say to those never. people? Never. It's never too late. And we see that in the evidence. It's not purely my opinion. It's never too late. It's never too late. But also that's combined with your feeling that, hey, look, 
just this focus on telling everybody to walk 10,000 steps a day, we're not going to get anywhere. No. Is that I, your belief? I That is my belief. And also that is, I don't consider that exercise. I just consider that physical activity. Yeah. That's just part of brushing your teeth. You do have to do, if I were to pick the most important exercise, it would be, or the most important exercise modality, it would be resistance training. Non-negotiable resistance training, which is moving something against force, and that could be bands. It doesn't have to be complicated. I came here with my uh, suitcase, and I have bands in there. Yes, I already have my gym planned of where I'm training today, but I still travel with a, a resistance band. I can do bicep curls. I can do squats with it. I can do whatever. That is a form of resistance training, and everybody can do that. Let's say they're at home thinking, you know, gosh, I can't do one push up. I can't do one pull up. Cool. What can you do? You can do something. You, I do not believe that you cannot do anything. You can do something. And here's the thing that really, there's two, and I don't want to get too philosophical, but number one, do people feel worthy of having health and wellness? They have to feel worthy of it, like they're deserving. In your experience, what is the main reasons why patients who come to see you don't feel worthy? It's usually past, um, it's usually some kind of past trauma, hmm. something that is maybe outside of their conscious awareness at the moment. How they were raised, yeah. adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. Or maybe they're getting too far in life and there's kind of this ceiling cap, this limiting belief. They're actually, the uh, patients, maybe a lot of my patients are very successful individuals uh, or running families. And sometimes they're like, well, do I really deserve to be this great? Hmm. So again, I can give someone the perfect plan, but if if the mind isn't right, it doesn't matter. And, and what do you do for those people who the mindset is holding them back? Do you, you refer expose them? It. You expose it. That in itself just works? Yes. Yes. Oh, you know, I trained two years in psychiatry. Oh, that's right. Did you know that? Yes. I do remember now. And one of the things is, is you have to under, so part of being a good physician is understanding patterns of illness, but being an effective physician, uh, being an effective physician is understanding patterns of people. And you use medicine as the modality to leverage the person to get the best out of themselves. So yes, if you are not picking up a weight, you're never going to feel comfortable doing it, just as you never feel comfortable embarking on something new, right? Courage is earned, so you have to do it. And for your recommendation, for most people, initially that's going to be, you know, even if you have to like save up for a little while, it's so important to find a trainer that even can show you some basic movements that you can do at home yourself. You can go to the YMCA. Okay, yeah, the YMCA, great option. Do they have like resistance training bands? That totally. You can kind of they have with? like silver sneakers. Yes. Amazing. So there's options at all levels. There's options at all levels and all price points. Yeah. There's options at all price points. But it's really first people have to deal with the mindset piece yeah. if that's the thing that's holding them back. Yes. Because your initial question was, what if someone is says, I can't do a push up, I can't do a pull up. They're just, the question is how, why are they at that point? What kind of framework brought them to that point? And we're jumping ahead a little bit, but we're going to jump all over. We there's, are? There's okay. so many, so many great <laughs> aspects of the book that are there. But now the question is, based on your experience and that walking is great, we're not discouraging anybody from walking. There's so many benefits to walking. We've had so many people on this podcast that are there. And a lot of people don't even get into walking and you actually, in my experience, you get even more excited about the walking when you're doing the resistance training. That's Because <laughs> you're like, oh, thank God I don't have to do any more training. Yeah, no, yeah. it's like a nice break, but you kind of feel like walking is a good way to like maintain in a way, hmm. right? It's like you just feel like excited. You feel that you feel the passion that comes with movement, right? right. And regular movement in your life. Yeah. And I like habit stacking. So, you know, I have a bunch of walks throughout the week where I walk with friends or I'll take a walking meeting or I'll walk with family members. And it's just a nice way to catch up with people or I'll walk and take a phone call. That's like just something that I regularly do in my life. And once I work it into my schedule, it's a lot easier to get those eight to 10,000 steps out of there. But when it comes to resistance training, and again, this is jumping ahead to the later part of the book, what is the amount that we're shooting for? We're going to get to protein. We focused a lot yeah. on protein in the last conversation. So what are we shooting for to really have it be that regular part of our life that helps us preserve and grow muscle? I think 
it's really simple and we can make it really simple. So everybody here says, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I love the, well, first let's lay out the general recommendations. The general recommendations are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity plus two days a week of strength training. I would recommend you shoot for three days a week of, you know, um, hitting each body part twice if you can. And that is very simple and you can do 10 sets total per muscle group and that can be spread throughout the week. And you can shoot for 8 to 12 to 15 reps, really kind of pushing yourself if you're going to do lighter weights, because maybe some of the older, uh, more mature individuals listening want to do lighter weights. That's perfectly acceptable as long as you are putting in enough effort and enough volume to stress the muscle, to create metabolic change and stress the muscle. So you're thinking less the sort of 150 minutes and you're more, hey, let's get three days a week. Exactly. Where in that three days, you're getting to hit each big muscle group twice. twice. I would love that. A minimum, yes. So that would be super easy to shoot for. And then for individuals who say, you know, they're really pressed for time, why not throw in some kind of very short, high intensity interval? It doesn't have to be running, right? I mean, you could see me running on a treadmill. It's a nightmare. You don't want to see that, it's, right? It's, uh, they could do an airdyne bike or they could do some kind of activity that is safe for them where they're putting out maximum effort. So let's zoom out for a second, right? Because for some people, this could feel like, okay, great. I'm on my way and I just need to turn up the dial a little bit, right? For other people, it's like, you know what? I've been doing a lot of cardio. I'm like a younger version of Betty, who you saw in your clinic, whether they're a guy or girl. And not that there's not benefits to that, but they're missing the strength training piece. And they're like, okay, I need to add that component in. And then for other people, that cohort is going to be, okay, I'm really living a more sedentary life. I'm clear that I'm sedentary. I need to light a fire under my ass and I need to do this. And it's not just to look better. Never. As you talked about Never. earlier. Yeah. It's not about looking better. It's actually about living longer. But I want to go back to that first question I asked you. What happens when people don't do this? When you were on the podcast last time, you were talking about one of the major challenges with people, especially women, as they get older and it's related to falls yeah. that are there. Can you share that information? Yeah. You know, one of the things that is a real issue for older individuals is, is if they fall, especially individuals over the age of 65. If they fall and they break a hip, the unintended consequences of not just the injury but the immobility, it's devastating. And I think that we all know people like that. What happens is over a period of time, immediately we put people on bed rest. So that is often used as people are recovering, depending on how bad the injury is. You know, again, there's various different protocols, but when an individual falls, there is impact, you know, on all domains of their health. Metabolically, older individuals who go through a catabolic crisis, which a fall would be considered a catabolic crisis, and here's why. People often think of aging as a linear thing. There's a slow, steady decline. In reality, that is not what happens. And this is some of the foundational work from Doug Patton Jones, where he really highlighted this idea of a catabolic crisis. A fall, a hip break creates this catabolic crisis. The subsequent effect on muscle tissue and muscle strength really creates a downward cascade of health and wellness. There's changes in um, blood sugar regulation, typically changes in fatty acid oxidation, changes in mitochondria health with the loss of skeletal muscle, all these different changes. And then when they are also sedentary, then the changes with that, and if they're hospitalized to contract an illness, people get pneumonia, the longer they're in the hospital, again, depending on, on what is happening, it is just a downward spiral. And so... It's not that treating the hip fracture isn't important. It's how do we prevent that? How do we prevent injury? And that becomes a really critical component. And so how do we prevent it? Connect, connecting yep. all the dots that you've shared so far. The way that we protect ourselves from aging is really focusing on this health of skeletal muscle. And there's a dietary component. There's a training aspect. And 
it's interesting because the younger we start, the better. So we are born with a certain amount of muscle fibers that we can grow. And there's other ways that we can augment it through resistance training, helps with this concept of uh, myonuclei and stem cell health, muscle satellite cells. But however, when you build up this reserve, when injury happens, your survivability is going to be exponentially higher. Your risk of all-cause mortality and morbidity increases the less muscle mass you have. So another way to put it is your survivability against anything that you face is going to be dependent in part by skeletal muscle. Mm. I mean, it's the only organ system that we can consciously control over a period of time. It's it. It's the only organ system. And again, if people are not having resistance training in their life, if they're not working out in a way that stimulates that muscle growth, and then on top of that, they're deprioritizing protein throughout the day, which we're going to get to in a second, they're setting themselves up for failure. Absolutely. It's, it's probably more important than any piece of advice, any piece of health advice that we could ever give someone. The, probably the most important piece of advice would be to do resistance training. Re do resistance training because the trickle-down effect of that is life-changing. Now, I will say you can't really out-train a bad diet, but even if you aren't seeing certain changes, you're creating this metabolic flux, you're maintaining the health of skeletal muscle, which is so pinnacle for your health and wellness as it relates to longevity. It is the thing. So I want to get a chance before we go into a little bit more of the details. And you know, a lot of the details are outlined in your book and you walk people through great recipes and the mindset piece. And yeah. there's a bunch of incredible charts in there. Let's start off big picture. What have been, I'm not saying that you agree with them, obviously you disagree with them, but what have been the counter arguments that people have had around this idea that we all need to be you know, strength training and prioritizing protein, is it been a little bit of like, hey, look at all these blue zones that are out there and they're just living their normal life. They're active in a way, but they're not at the gym. They're not doing necessarily, you know, resistance training in the way that we would think of it over here. Is that one of them that's out there that you've seen? I mean, I, my answer to that would be, we don't live in blue zones. We don't live there. How are we going to make up for the environment? And the reality of where we live. I mean, we have to be able to offset our life, the reality of where we're living and what we're doing with diet and nutrition. So I'll give you an example. My dad, my dad lives in Ecuador. My dad will walk, if it is under four miles, he'll walk there, or four hours, he'll walk there. How old is he? 74. That's great. He'll walk there. Uh, he doesn't really go to the gym but he does push-ups and carries all his groceries and does all of those things. Super healthy, has a higher testosterone level than nearly guys half his age. He's doing amazing. He's probably in the sun a lot. All the time. And he lives in Ecuador. He's not using elevators. He's not using escalators. We who live in the U.S., we don't function like that, at least to the best of my knowledge. So how do we change our food and exercise to offset the domestication of us? One of the reasons obesity is so hard to treat is because fundamentally we are looking at the wrong problem. And issues like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, these are diseases of skeletal muscle first. Boom. This is a, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. And we're going to unpack it all. Yeah. Now, let me start off with something that you shared. Okay. Right? It's that you were saying that we're not over fat, we're under muscle. Yeah. Now, can it be both? And asking the context of the pandemic and everything mm -hmm. that we saw with people that had poor metabolic health, yeah. people that were obese, being a higher risk, passing away, unfortunately. Yeah. Isn't it a little bit of both? So it is a little bit of both. And when I think about the idea of core treatment and symptomology. Obesity is a symptom. It's not at the root. If individuals have healthy skeletal muscle, 
their survivability across all illnesses, which is very rare to be able to say that in medicine. So I am saying, Drew, if you have healthy skeletal muscle, if you have enough, if you have enough body armor, you are not only going to be able to survive through issues that happen during the pandemic, but also you'll be metabolically healthy. And I know that that's a core theme of yours. You talk a lot about metabolic health. And in my mind, when we think about skeletal muscle, we have to think about what it does. So let's get into that. And yeah. Let's talk about it for especially our audience, of which course. is primarily female. But which shout which out all to I the men. actually think that that's amazing and love that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Shout out to everybody who's listening, <laughs> of course. Yes. But for our audience and through the different stages of yeah. life, how and can you give some examples of how important muscle is and what it actually helps people do, especially for women? Yes. Well, of course, this happens to be my favorite topic. When you think about muscle, we often think about it in the fitness realm. And of course, that's what we hear. You think about bodybuilders, you think about protein, and really that's a conversation that is typically thought of in their 20s, right? And it's so interesting because muscle, and we're talking about skeletal muscle now, is so much more valuable than that. The idea of locomotion and physical fitness is one small aspect of what muscle does. Muscle is actually, and by the way, makes up 40% of your body. It is the largest organ system in the body. Skeletal muscle is an organ system. And we must, if we want to change the trajectory of how people are aging and what we are seeing and obesity, we must address skeletal muscle as the organ system that it is. Now, I know it sounds like a very basic question. No, no but... question is basic because we do have to lay the foundation of what muscle does, how do we stimulate it, how it relates to health and wellness. Of course, of course. Yeah. That's what you're here to do. Yes. So you're saying skeletal muscle. Yeah. What muscle is not skeletal muscle if you can break that down? So smooth muscle, things that you don't have voluntary control over. Got it. You know, um, and the, of course is uh, cardiac muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and smooth muscle, and then the skeletal muscle, which you have direct control over. And again, just mention a few of those. So like a uterus. A uterus would be a smooth muscle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's not what we're talking about. No, we are not talking about this. We are talking about muscles that have voluntary control that, like, for example, your bicep or your quadricep, things that you can move. Now, we know, and we've talked about on this podcast yeah. before, that one of the leading indicators of, uh, you know, old age is mm. grip strength. Yep. Right? And that's one of the greatest predictors of uh, your likelihood of uh, death, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. And so we understand that, especially as people get older, mm -hmm. having muscle is actually what protects their bones yes. from fracture, from breaking. And when older people, especially, mm -hmm. break a bone, I was just talking to a friend the other day, her mom, yeah. unfortunately, fell down while playing pickleball. And she's a walker, Her friend, my friend was saying, but mm. she doesn't really do a lot of muscle boating activities, yeah. no resistant training. She fell in a very simple fall, mm. ended up shattering her ankle. And my heart goes out to her and her mom. It was yes. a very sad story. And in the hospital, like a lot of people get into the hospital, they yeah. start to rapidly decline, especially yes. when they're bedridden. You right? know, it's really interesting. And I'm going to share a very scary statistic. For women over the age of 65, if they fall, 50% of them will never walk again. Wow. Say that one more time, because that's like mind blowing. <laughs> For a woman, 65 or older, if she falls, there's a 50% chance she will never walk again. So what that would look like what? She is bedridden or wheelchair bound? Yeah, she, yes. I mean, you know, there's an extreme risk of death. Oftentimes people end up having to go to assisted living. There are very tragic and predictable outcomes that happen if you don't address skeletal muscle midlife. And again, there's multiple things that skeletal muscle does, which I think we should discuss as it relates to metabolism. And also there's a natural decline in skeletal muscle as we age. Yeah, It's really interesting. There's a physiological process that happens, uh, one of which is called anabolic resistance. And it's this idea that skeletal muscle is actually a nutrient sensor. It mm. senses protein. And the efficiency by which it does that decreases as we age. Which is why it's harder to put on muscle as we age. And also there's a decrease in hormones. For women, especially during perimenopause, menopause, 
they're, that is the time in which they have the most rapid decline in muscle mass. And we're more likely, I've heard you on many interviews mm. talk about, we're more likely to become insulin resistant. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Lower, yeah. Just explain how that works okay. because we've done so many episodes yes. on metabolic health. I love this. And we always talk about glucose monitors right. and the benefit right. and looking at your fasting insulin, but make the connection between muscle okay. and- I would love to. I believe that obesity is a disease of skeletal muscle. And here is why. Insulin resistance, which you've talked about probably in many podcasts, insulin is the peptide hormone that is necessary to move glucose out of the bloodstream into cells. And glucose is very interesting because it's a double-edged sword. We need it, yet it is toxic. So skeletal muscle is the site for 80 plus percent of glucose disposal. 80 to maybe 90% of glucose disposal is skeletal muscle. It's used by those muscles. Yes. Which is why, just to connect the dots yep. for people listening, if you eat like a big meal and then you go on a fast-paced walk or you're doing like some you are, curls yes. or some squats or whatever, yes. that actually helps lower your blood sugar. Yes. You well, are. initially you might see a little spike, but your blood sugar on average right. comes down afterwards. Skeletal muscle is really at the focal point of metabolic regulation. And most importantly, insulin resistance starts in skeletal muscle first. So let's think about that. So it's 40% of our body weight. It's the site for glucose disposal. And it's the site where insulin resistance starts first. Think about muscle as a suitcase. If you fill it up, right, if you're eating and you fill it up and you don't unpack it by training, then what happens? You can only stuff so much in and then it the rest, fatty acids, their increase in glucose, it goes back into the bloodstream. That is why I believe the diseases of insulin resistance, obesity, and these issues that go alongside of them begin in skeletal muscle. And it's actually in the literature. Yet we, for whatever reason, have not focused on skeletal muscle as the focal point, as the pinnacle. It is always a periphery. And really in fitness, there's this huge gap between exercise and fitness and muscle as this metabolic organ. Very superficially, we kind of divide the two, but ultimately, if you care about these diseases of aging, then you must optimize skeletal muscle and you must transition the way in which you eat, the way in which you train as you age. Wow. It's fantastic to get a chance to go through all that because for a lot of people, I think you would say, which is why you are so focused on your message. You've launched a podcast, yep. by the way. Yep. What's the name of the podcast? The Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. We'll link to these show notes. <laughs> yep. You have a book coming out in October. Mm -hmm. It's an important message because it feels like it makes sense when right. you're listening to it. Now, people are trying to understand all the behind the scenes. Right. And they're also trying to compare it to some of the other content that they're hearing out there. One of the ones yeah. that people hear, mm. which would be a great opportunity to just bring up early, is that actually too much protein in the diet, which how does muscle get made? Protein right. is a key element yeah. of it. Not the only element, but a key element of it has been linked to a lot of different chronic diseases. Let's right. just touch on that. We'll dive deeper into it later okay. on. But let's just touch on that for a second. Well, I now I'm a trained geriatrician from WashU, which is a very excellent institution. And one of the things and one of the most important aspects of health, longevity, aging has been protein. And there is a lot of myths about dietary protein, none of which, by the way, have been validated. Observational data, epidemiology data does one thing. And typically, when we think about the hierarchy of evidence, we take epidemiology and then we do randomized control human trials. And what we know is that based on the randomized control human trials, that now the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is the bare minimum of protein per day. So that is the bare minimum set to prevent deficiencies. It is not the maximum. And I would just like to bring up this example of vitamin C. Vitamin C, do you know the RDA of vitamin C? I don't know. 60, 60 milligrams, very, very low. Now, if you were getting sick or you needed an extra boost, would you hesitate to take more vitamin C? Not at all. 
In fact, you would be like, nah, I'm not feeling great. Maybe I'll take some vitamin C, right? Well, the RDA there is clearly that it's 60 milligrams to prevent deficiencies, but most people, nearly everybody, would be willing to say that is not a maximum. Yet when we look at dietary protein that's set at 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, people say, no, 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 that's the maximum. I am using this example to highlight the huge dichotomy that we have between nutrients and then this macronutrient protein, which is arguably the elephant in the room, right? It is the black sheep of the macronutrient family. The data would support that nearly double that is what is more optimal. In human randomized control trials, we know that optimizing for protein, those people always do better. They have better body composition. They have healthier lean muscle mass. They have better insulin and glucose control. These are very important measurable outcomes that we know. We also know that it improves satiation and it protects tissue. And in fact, the body, there's protein turnover that happens about 300 grams a day. We have to account for that. And not only that, but protein is essential. And there's never any evidence, there has not been to my knowledge, nor in the literature to support higher levels of dietary protein having any kind of negative effect, yeah. ever. Ever, but epidemiology, it's really interesting. So if you look at the relative risk, so the relative risk is what we consider in medicine when it is two or, or above two, we consider it clinically significant. So we'll say smoking and lung cancer, the relative risk would be 12, okay? And this is just based on the data. So they have looked at protein and the relative risk of protein intake and any kind of illness is 1.2. So according to the evidence, it's not clinically significant. And I'm really glad you bring up this point because the evidence doesn't support the narrative. And I will say that if you look at the history, people have been arguing about nutrition and nutrition science forever, since the 1800s. And when I think of the word food, what do you think of when you think of food? You might have a different uh, perspective because you are very involved in the world of food. But when you think of food, what do you think? First thing. Uh, food, I see like abundance, like a farmer's market type of yeah, feel. Yeah, okay. Like a lot of like mm -hmm. you know, bright, colorful things that sort of draw you in. Do you think about emotion and family and community, which I know is big, and even comfort, right? A lot yeah. of women. But you don't necessarily think of, off the top of your head, the biochemical nutrient processes of mm -hmm. the hard science of food. So we have food, which is emotional. It's my grandmother's cookies. It's the holidays. It's I'm feeling stressed. I'm going to eat. Food is so much more. And then you have the science aspect. So the science is hypotheses that can be tested, a body of literature that can be learned upon. It can be tested and tested over again. So we have food science as the ultimate oxymoron. I'm bringing this up to set the stage for the confusion around food. Nobody argues about calculus. Nobody even argues about biochemistry. Yet here we have a hard science, which is a food science, and we are all arguing about it. That is unusual for any avenue of a hard science. Is it because also just like nutritional studies that especially have anything to do with longevity are like tough to do in a like a human level and following people over that period of time? Is that part of this? I don't think so. I think it's from biases. I think that food, even of a scientist perspective, I think it can be very clouded. I think that Evidence is evidence, and there's half a century of data to support higher protein diets for humans, yet there's still more epidemiology, there's still bad press about protein, and I don't believe that it's based on confusion, because again, there are many human randomized control trials that support dietary protein. And I wasn't even aware, so I've been 
mentored by one of the world leading protein scientists. His name is Dr. Donald Lehman, and um, he's mentored me for two decades. I worked when I was in my undergrad in some of the early human studies. And at that time, it wasn't such a hot topic in terms of argument. But, you know, it's really interesting as I'm writing my book, I'm looking back at the literature and World War II, uh, during the rationing times, there were recommendations. And the recommendations for protein, are you ready for what those were? The yes. soldiers were given at least one pound of meat a day. An injured soldier, and this is from literature in the 1940s, I think 1945, an injured soldier was given 250 grams of protein. And what the records are showing and what was reported was that they had a 50% increase in their healing capacity. And this is before all the um, kind of narrative and fighting. This is just what they were doing. And back on home soil, people were encouraged to grow victory gardens. All the high quality protein was sent overseas. They had to feed a million people. They were encouraged to eat grains. They were given and rationed one egg a day. They were eating processed foods, more processed foods, more grains. And there was an acknowledgement that this protein was so valuable that we were gonna send it all overseas. Fast forward 80 years later, to now what we're seeing, we're seeing the same kind of narrative wrapped up differently. We are hearing protein is bad for longevity, protein is bad for the planet, or it's bad for your health. We should eat more grains. We should be more vegetarian. And what I think is really interesting is that the same recommendations are happening with a new narrative. And what I feel is most important is that we all want a healthy world, all of us, you, me, all the work that you do. And in order to have a healthy world, we must have transparent conversations. And that is what is missing. Hmm. You know, last time we chatted, I had a big aha moment from something hmm. that you shared. And I just want to add this into the mix. Yeah. Uh, because you're not out here, like, first of all, like, you just want people to be healthy. You're not trying to tell people what to do. Absolutely right? not. And you're trying to show them that, hey, look, if something isn't working and you don't feel like your best, yeah. or if you care about this topic of longevity, here's a crucial conversation that you might be missing out. Right. right? One of the things you mentioned last time is I was telling you that I come from, uh, you know, growing up, I was vegetarian. Yeah. And on my, both my mom and dad's side of the family, there's a long history of, you know, vegetarian ism or vegetarians. Hmm. And especially for my moms, it's probably one of the longest, uh, and everybody in my podcast knows I'm not vegetarian now. Uh, and by the way, I used to be vegetarian. Yeah. We'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah. We'd love to talk, talk yeah. to you about that. I have a few questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, my mom's side, the Jane tradition, J-A-I-N, mm. yep, one of the longest yes. Uh, yes. continuously running yes. group of vegetarians that mm -hmm. are there. And um, I was sharing with you that, you know, when I go to India and I'll spend time, you know, these pockets, because India is struggling mm -hmm. with major outbreaks of metabolic health issues. Right. It's like something crazy. Like it's uh, India is only 18% of the population in the world, but they have almost like 40% of all the heart attacks right. in the world. It's like nuts, yeah. right? The metabolic health is going nuts. But when I see um, people who are older in these pockets and I go and visit or I go to the rural areas right. and I see older individuals that are there, uh, you know, and often people who are maybe still farmers or things like that, they're they're very lean, okay, but they're shredded, uh -huh. right? Like yeah. they're lean, like yeah. they don't have bellies and other things like that, and they're not eating protein like on in animal protein at all, right? And I was asking you about that, and you were like, "Look, one thing that's important for you, and let's see if I got it right, and then yeah. correct me if I got okay. it wrong, and build on it." She's so like, "One thing important to understand is that the more you work out." Yes. the less protein you need, right? So if there's people that all day are out in the sun, yeah. working all the time, they're moving doing, their muscle, move, yeah. moving their muscle, yeah. they're gonna have shredded muscle, mm -hmm. right? And they're constantly moving their body and maybe their protein requirement is different. Now, if you have other people that are not in that space- Which most people are not, Most right? people are not. Most people are not. And then the other next question I would say is, what then becomes optimal? Right. So, but that was just interesting yeah. for me to hear yeah. because it was putting into context yeah. that 
I was like, okay, wait, why is it working for this one group? Even yeah. though this is anecdotal evidence, I haven't right. put a whole population set together. Yeah. These could be just outliers that are part of it. It's like, what is going on with them? And again, like you said, most people are not in that situation right. where they're working their body out, you know, eight to 16 hours a day. Right. You know, and I would say I probably would mention that number one, calories matter, and then also the repair and recovery of their bodies. So do they need less protein? They certainly could get away with less because they're moving and they're keeping their muscle healthy and subtle and supple. Um, and again, the question would be, would it be optimal? And this is a beautiful segue to say one of the things that happens with aging muscle is, again, muscle as an organ is a nutrient sensor. And when we think about a practical, from a practical standpoint, you know, if you are going to eat for longevity, and that's also something we should define yeah. in terms of what actually is longevity. Sure. Is it six weeks, six months, six hours? I think it's a very nebulous term. I would even argue that it's not about the length of time you live. You know, I, I worked in a nursing home for two years. That is not a pretty picture. We have become very capable and able to keep people alive for periods of time that um, there's quite a bit of suffering that happens. Yeah. I would argue it's the quality of life and the strength. The health span. And the, exactly. And if we reduce dietary protein during the time in which you have the most capacity to build it in your 30s, 40s, this is the time where you build tissue. If those individuals decide that they are going to go on a lower protein diet and not really train, it doesn't get easier to build muscle. In your 50s and 60s, it's more difficult. And we really have to think, what are the health outcomes that we're looking at? And I would argue, while there's nebulous outcomes, there are very clear outcomes, like you mentioned grip strength, like you mentioned physical strength, like you mentioned you know, being able to be metabolically healthy. And the other thing that we know is the more healthy muscle you have, that is your amino acid reserve. If a person were to get injured, the thing that is going to save them is their muscle. Individuals that get cancer, 50 to 80% are going to get cachexia. That is a muscle wasting. The survivability of those individuals is going to be based on their skeletal muscle. There's something going to be coming out called the EAA9, or the, yeah, the EAA9. And what this is, is it's this idea of we have 14 essential vitamins and minerals, which we all talk about, this 14 essential vitamins and minerals, but we have nine essential amino acids. But that is actually not something that is shown on the back of a food label. So all protein is not equal and we need these essential amino acids and we need to be able to look at these nutrients, these amino acids as nutrients individually. So what am I saying? I'm saying that could you maintain and even build muscle on a plant-based diet if protein is high enough? You could. Would it be very difficult to do it from whole food sources? It would be. But it's not just about the macronutrient. It is also about these essential amino acids. And we have to move away from protein as just simply one macronutrient, which is really the majority of the discussion now. The majority of the discussion is animal proteins are different than plant proteins, but it's still protein. That's true. However, the reality is that they're made up of 20 different amino acids. And these nine essential amino acids all have dual roles meaning it's not just about muscle health. For example, let's take threonine. Threonine is an essential amino acid that's really important for mucin production, which is helps with the mucosal lining of the gastrointestinal tract. We have phenylalanine, which is really important for dopamine production. We have tryptophan, which is really important for serotonin production. We have leucine, which is really critical for muscle protein synthesis in stimulating mTOR. What I'm saying is that each amino acid has a unique biological role and more than one biological role above and beyond protein turnover and muscle protein synthesis. Yet what we continue to do is just talk about protein as one macronutrient. So if you are going to go plant-based, how are you going to account for these individual amino acids? And right now, there's a lot of talk about protein quality, which is typically either the diaz or PDCAS. 
a PDCAS, and they've only looked at, the Diaz, I think, has only looked at 100 foods. And it looks at it based on a limiting amino acid versus there's 15,000 new foods every year. It's not even accounted for. The essential amino acid scoring system, the EAA9, which is, I believe, in the next few years going to score these amino acids. So when you look at the back of a protein bar, you'll actually get a score. I think that they're going to instill it in Whole Foods and Walmart, and it's a group called the Wise Code Group. You'll be able to see that not all these essential amino acids are equally essential. For example, let's take something simple like leucine. Leucine is one of those essential amino acids necessary for muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis, mTOR, again, these dual roles. The RDA has that at, I don't know, two to three grams per day. But the reality is we probably need closer to eight to nine grams per day. But again, none of that is accounted for when you look at the back of a protein recommendation, right? It's just gross protein recommendations. Overall, we have to become more savvy to this idea that it's not just about the macronutrient protein, but it is about these individual amino acid requirements. For example, methionine. A vegan diet is very low in methionine. Methionine is important for cysteine production and taurine production and glutathione. So how do we begin to balance the, this concept of dietary protein and these, uh, this other concept of individual amino acids? and individual amino acids as their own nutrient. And I, I think that that's really the next wave of where protein is going. Let's come back to some of the basics around protein. Where and how much do you want people to shoot for? And, and talk about that in the course of also a day. A day. You know, that's yep. a big part of your book is helping people understand. Yeah. You've even been a lot of our, your recent like Instagram reels, like you had one where you're talking about like how to fit in the oh, protein. God, those are so the those are so painful, but I do it because they're great, they're somewhat entertaining, and and maybe helpful. People love it. They love seeing the visual. Like sometimes yeah. people are visual, and they see it, and they like just they get it. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we have it up here. We'll link to it in the show notes so people can see. So walk us through here. What are you, what are you showing yeah. the folks how to do? So this is idea. Uh, this uh, concept is how are we going to build more skeletal muscle, right? The more muscle you have, the more healthy muscle you have, the greater your place for glucose disposal, the greater your protection. Why do we care about hypertrophy? Number one, you care about muscle hypertrophy because you are building your body armor. How are you going to do it? Exactly how you're doing it at your gym. You are increasing your calories by 10 to 20%. For really optimizing muscle health, the way that I think about it is protein is 1 to 1.2 grams per pound, ideal body weight. Yep, that's what you wrote. Okay, that's good. Fat, I don't really care about fat, quite frankly. Fat and carbohydrates, you decide. You actually can decide wherever your preference is. I do like the idea of some carbohydrates from muscle glycogen. Carbohydrate could be 1.2 to 3.6 grams per pound ideal body weight. And then fat, you can fill in the rest. So so first, just to because I was a lot there for people, especially if you're not watching the video, but we have a link in the <laughs> If you watch the, show the video, I'm sorry in advance. No, the video is great. It's cool. It's people get to, you know, see you in your kitchen and, and making food for you and your family. The the big component that you're saying here and that you outlined in the book is that before we get into carbs and we before we get into fats. And there's going to be variation that's there for people. And both of those are like highly sort of debated things that are out there. Not that protein isn't debated. Everything is debated these days. Um, prioritize protein in your yeah. day, right? That's the message. 100%. When you prioritize dietary protein, everything else will fall into play. And in fact, there's a ton of evidence to support weight loss by just prioritizing protein. When things are even isocaloric, meaning when you have the same amount of calories. So let's say you have, and we worked on some of these earlier studies. Uh, let's say you have 1600 calories on both a higher carbohydrate diet and a higher protein diet. So 1600 calories, and you just change the ratios of protein those individuals will lose body fat, maintain lean muscle mass, have better triglycerides and better um, just b overall body composition. And, and why is that? Yeah. Why do you think that that's taking place? Well, number one, uh, dietary protein is very difficult to store as fat. It is also utilized by the body. The body needs protein. It is an essential need. When you eat it in certain proportions per se, for example, enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, quite simply between 
30 and 50 grams, you stimulate the machinery of the muscle. And that becomes somewhat of a metabolically expensive process. And that is, you know, there's also data to support that prioritizing dietary protein will help safeguard against adaptive thermogenesis, which is quite simply when your metabolism slows down when you are dieting. You're sharing with us how important dietary protein is. You're laying the groundwork. Just a couple clarifying questions. If someone is not working out, which is obviously not what you're recommending to people, right? But you're talking about society as a whole, like people are not doing resistance training. Which we have to figure out a way to inspire them to, fix, to do that. Yeah, we have to fix it. And <laughs> and I think that really it's about getting people to start younger and it's just baked in their life, I agree. right? It's baked in their life and it's just like we don't know a time where it wasn't baked in. I agree. Maybe it would be something with the school system, although I'm not hopeful about that. Let's see if it ends up happening. But right now people are not. They won't necessarily automatically start growing a bunch of muscle just from eating a lot more protein appropriate to their you know, one gram or 1.2 grams per ideal body weight. Is that right? Correct. They, If you are deficient in dietary protein, which by the way, 40% of women over the age of 65, according to NHANES data, they're eating less than the RDA for protein. 40% hmm. of women over the age of 65 are eating less than the RDA of dietary protein, which means they are protein deficient. Got it. That's important. When you think about... Um, putting on skeletal muscle, those individuals, if they were to increase dietary protein, they may see positive gains in skeletal muscle because they are protein deficient. Okay. But an individual who is uh, already on a higher protein diet and just adding protein, will they put on muscle? Uh, I would say that would be unlikely. You do have to have a stimulus. But is part of your argument that even if you're not working out by increasing your protein intake, and obviously everybody's going to be on the spectrum, yeah. you you're not going to lose as much muscle as the statistics that you, you brought You will up. not lose as much muscle. Dietary protein is the one thing that shouldn't change. If anything, it should increase. When you think about calorie reduction, you reduce your calories from fats and carbohydrates. You don't reduce your calories from protein. Protein should remain stable. Protein turnover, this process of kind of um, regenerating, renewing protein, that's around 250 grams a day, if not higher. And you're only eating a hundred and for you like 140 grams. An individual isn't going to eat the amount of protein that they're turning over. Let's make this real. Like, how much protein do you shoot for in a day for you, right? And walk us through your day of how you get that yep. protein. Well, I'm a, I'm a relatively tiny person. I don't need that much. I eat about 120 grams of protein a day, and that's easy for me. I just split it up in. Typically, I might do two larger meals of 50 grams of protein and then a smaller meal in the middle. Easy, 20 grams, maybe. And the last time you were on this podcast, you were talking about the benefit of having 30 grams of protein, like kind of early in the morning. Mm -hmm. Not early, like we're not talking about 5 a.m., yeah. but your first meal. Yeah. Right? Is that something that you still practice I do. or recommend? I do. These are, um, Drew, they're really insightful questions. Here's why. The idea of 30 grams of protein three times a day, is that necessary? It's actually not necessary. And I know you're mentioning um, 30 grams in the morning, but I'm pretty sure I spoke about an even distribution. And I want to put some context around that. Please. The first meal of the day is most important. And nearly all the research in nearly all the research regarding dietary protein as it relates to meals are done with that first meal. It's coming out of an overnight fast. It's easier to look at the mechanisms. It's just easier to look at everything. There's less variable. The muscle is primed for stimulus. It is in a catabolic state. It is primed for stimulus. Between 30 and arguably even 50 grams will kind of max out that system of muscle protein synthesis. Here's something else that I realize I haven't really highlighted before is muscle protein synthesis is a biomarker. It is a physiological process of incorporating amino acids. Muscle protein synthesis is turning on the machinery. Again, it is a metabolic process. Ultimately, over time, the outcome that you hope for is muscle gain or muscle accretion. But muscle protein synthesis, it's not like a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not like you stimulate your muscle and then all of a sudden you've put on, on mass. But... What we can see is that 
when you stimulate muscle protein synthesis, you're beginning to incorporate these amino acids into tissue. And that is what we believe to be as a marker for muscle health. So 30 to 50 grams at that first meal provides you with an opportunity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Now, there's a couple other things that happen. Number one, when your diet is prioritizing protein first, we talked about satiation in the beginning, some great work by Heather Lighty, and that, you know, what it looks at is that those that prioritize protein at that first meal compared to carbohydrates are much less likely to crave something or to go and eat the donut. It, it seems to affect satiation in a way that augments willpower. You are less likely to crave and reach for something that maybe perhaps you shouldn't. It also can stabilize blood sugar. The ebbs and flows of the ebbs and flows of blood sugar will create a bit of havoc in the body. When blood sugar goes high and you increase your insulin, you have a subsequent drop in blood sugar. This can create a increase in catecholamines and increase in cortisol, and this ebb and flow will make you hungry and tired. And it's just not ideal to have this kind of variation. It's much better to have stable blood sugar levels. And then, of course, uh, thinking about um, thermogenesis, the impact of dietary protein on metabolism. All I mean, there's no reason why someone would not prioritize protein in that first meal. So going back to what you ate, you mentioned you have two meals a day and then like a snack. Mm -hmm. Just just walk us through. Like, yeah. What are you actually eating in that first meal? So the first meal may be a frittata. It might be however we make it. We prepare for the week, right? I don't leave anything up to chance. I have two little children. My husband is a surgical resident working 100 hours. We leave nothing up to chance. We prepare all the food. I will have a frittata that's already been made, and that might have six eggs in it total, or it might have four eggs and some lean turkey in it, something like that. That will be the first meal of the day. The second meal might be, I don't know, a small beef stick, might be today I'm going to have, <laughs> I'm going to have beef sticks for breakfast. I was uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, been in the car for a while. And then that last meal of the day we eat with the family and that might be beef, some kind of vegetable and it's just really simple. And maybe midday I might have a shake. So that sounds so simple. And, and it after, is so simple. And it is so simple. Yeah. And yet a lot of what I heard from my audience, especially kind of skewing towards the the female demographic that follows, is they were imagining that that it's it's in their experience, they're thinking or they're facing against these different mental roadblocks or preparation blur blocks of, man, I'm not able to get that amount of protein. What do you think are the common mistakes that you see people that you addressed inside of the book? Well, they don't know how much they're actually getting, just like you didn't know. No, meaning this is now for people who like are awake after our first episode, that you, you, the last one that you were on, and they're like, okay, I got to start totally. tracking. Right. And they're like, hey, I want to shoot for that ideal, you know, a gram to 1.2 for ideal. They can go even lower. So what, you, what I'm hearing you say is people are like, I'm on board. Mm -hmm. How am I going to get 140 grams of protein? Or how am I going to get 120 grams of protein? Right. And they're kind of hitting some roadblocks. Right. So what are the common ones that they hit? Um, the, some of the common ones are not preparing. I'm going to just be truthful, yeah, not preparing. That's the biggest one. It is the biggest one because it's actually you have to eat. And if you prepare, then it's not going to be a roadblock. If you know that you have to eat, then you'll prepare. Maybe you're going to prepare some beef patties or turkey patties. Just make it super easy so that you are never at the whim of what should I eat. Do you, you know, you see a lot of type A personalities. I do. Right? Do you see a lot? And just my experience, and it could be incorrect. But there's a lot of type A personalities that I see that just also just skip meals. Do you ever notice that in your practice before you've had the chance to kind of yeah. recorrect it? But once we correct it, yes, I see a lot of type A personalities. Once we correct it and they are on board, they do better than ever. That's amazing. They do. And especially the athletes, we they oftentimes will fast and, and they, they skip breakfast. As soon as we implement that first meal, they do so much better. Mm. And it's easy for them. Again, you said you stack habits. It's the same thing. Yeah. And a lot of them do shakes. So a lot of the busy moms and people out there, they'll do a protein shake. That is perfectly fine. Do a protein shake in the morning. And put what would you put inside of it? Uh, I would do a scoop and a half of, a scoop and a half of protein. I would use a whey protein. 
You can choose whatever you want. I use first form, a natural way. Scoop and a half of scoop and a half of protein. You can blend it with 30 grams of some kind of carbohydrate if you want. And that could be berries. We use blueberries or whatever. Um, and if you're dying for a little bit of fat, put in a scoop of MCT oil. Make it easy. Easy. That's it. Any other? So besides prep preparation and besides not relying on because of our lifestyle is so chaotic for a lot of yeah. people and busy. And there's people like you guys who have, you know, kids. How many kids do you have now? Two. Two kids. Your husband's in residency. Yep. And you have an active and busy life. You're an entrepreneur, you're a mom, you're building business, you're launching a book, et cetera. There's a lot of people that are doing a lot. Yeah. Comparatively to sort of like our world maybe wasn't as in the current way. It was chaotic in its own way back in the day, mm. but it's more stimulating. Yeah. And so preparation is a big part of that. And part of that is relying on, you know, things like some sort of concentrated form of protein that's a little easier to get down like a smoothie. Yeah. And so for example, before I got on the plane, I packed beef jerky, I packed uh, some bison bars. I even don't laugh at me, but I even packed canned chicken. That is some serious preparation. I don't even know okay. this old canned chicken. Yeah, exactly. And there's a reason. <laughs> I have it all prepared. Yeah. And I'm extremely busy. I again, there's a lot of moving parts. And I packed it in my bag. Mhm. I'll even give you one before I leave. Nice. <laughs> you might not talk to me anymore after you taste it, but still. So I have prepared. I knew exactly what's going to be happening. And you want to know what else I did is I knew that after the podcast, I'm going to be tired and I'm probably going to want something sweet. So I packed some hue chocolate, like they're covered in the golden berries, mm -hmm. you know, those ones. Mm -hmm. And then also some keto gummies. I, I know you got to know your weaknesses, right? I'm going to be hungry. After I train today, I'm going to be hungry. Easy. And Easy. it's still within my calorie range. Any other top mistakes you see people make when it comes to like they've, they, they get it. Protein is important. They understand muscle is key. Muscle is the organ of longevity. Yes, as you sir. Say, right. Yeah. They, they get it. Now they're prioritizing it. They want to shift their life. They, of course, the hope is to have them mm -hmm. focus on, you know, the working out piece, which we covered earlier. And now they're dialing in the protein piece as well. Any other common mistakes or roadblocks you see them make? Uh, chaotic eating, not being structured. You mm. really should eat at the same time every day. This is the time that you're eating. You're not kind of going off track because what happens is, is your mind will tell you to do all kinds of things. When you create structure and you follow that structure, people do better. So you'll say, hey, it's nine o'clock, nine in the morning, I'm having my first meal. Uh, it's noon or one, I'm having my second. Then between noon and four for your next meal or noon and five, if you're like, oh, well, I'm going to go snack or go do this. Well, but that's actually not on your plan. That's not part of your structure. And nothing will pull someone out of their structure if they feel like there's a break in their integrity. You got to be very conscious. You make a promise to yourself that you're going to do this thing, that you're going to set a goal and you're going to execute on the goal, even if it's subtle. But when you begin to kind of go off course, this it's just a very subtle kind of undermining that happens. And every time you do it, it, it sabotages a person. So put together a strategy and a structure that you stick to. So no chaotic eating. This is your plan and this is how you're going to execute it. And the biggest fear around sort of chaotic eating is that when you get unstructured in one way, it's just easier for you then to not track your protein. It's easier for you That's to kind right. of fall off track. It's not that like I've heard the argument from individuals like Sachin Panda about chronobiology yeah. and how our body actually does better and makes better utilization mm -hmm. of the nutrients that we eat when we have a more structured sort of approach mm -hmm. generally, right? You have the variation that happens in the year because of the seasons and maybe eating earlier or eating a little bit later, depending on the time of year. Yeah. But generally, our body actually enjoys and thrives on that structure, right? Do you agree with that? I do. I recently, we haven't released the episode, but I recently had Sachin on. And yeah. I agree with him. Okay. So in addition to him, really you're coming from the place of the mindset piece. Yeah. That if you're eating at different times every single day, it's another thing that's out of order. It's another thing to think about. It's kind of like back in the day when you saw a lot of CEOs and executives, and I think even presidents have done this before too, you know, hey, this is the only clothes that I'm going to wear. Yeah. And I'm taking that 
out because I don't want decision fatigue. Every new decision I make yes. creates another obstacle in my life. That's right. And nobody is making more decisions in a day than a busy mom. <laughs> yeah. And the other aspect is, Drew, I am a physician who sees patients and seeing what they go through and what they need and where their pitfalls are allows me to put into place things that will prevent them from having these roadblocks. No more chaotic eating. Structure your plan. Plan it out. Don't go into the grocery store and guess what you're going to get. Have it. Like there's no, oh, I'm just going to go to lunch with friends. You will sabotage yourself. Plan it out. Those are the biggest roadblocks. From a practical level, having a family, mm -hmm. how do you guys plan those basics, which obviously it comes second nature for you. You've been doing this for a really yes. long time, but just structurally, right? Do you do the grocery shopping? Do you and your husband do it together? Do you alternate? And when do you sit down to actually sort of put together a shopping list based on what's coming up that week? I'm sure a certain part of this is like automated because mm -hmm. this is what you guys live and breathe. Yes. But just walk us through some of that. So one of the things that we do is we meal plan um, on Sunday for the week. What mm -hmm. are we going to be doing? And on like a practical level, like do you do it earlier in the day? Yep. Like, and is it you and hus your husband sitting at the table? Nope. It's me saying, okay, so I think this is what we're going to have. And he's like, okay, yeah, no, that sounds good. Okay. So, okay. So because the, these are the nuances that people want to hear yeah. about, what have you found? Does, when it comes to a family and, and a family getting on board and eating healthy, right? Some people aren't in a family, they're single and, you know, obviously they would have to modify, but do you generally find that families do better when it's one person who's sort of leading the meal planning versus like this 50-50 approach? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it really depends on what an individual has going on. Um, so for me personally, again, my husband is a surgical resident, so he's working 100 hours a week. He's in a crazy time in his life. Oh, well, he was a SEAL before, so I think it, this so is actually- So crazy before, so it's less <laughs> so crazy it's, now. it's totally less crazy. But he's still yeah. young, so he's going to have to do the yeah. grocery- Once he's done with all this, oh, he's going to do the grocery shopping like, forever. Uh, yeah, forever, for the rest <laughs> of his life. So there's balance in that. Uh, oh, yeah. I plan- <laughs> So basically, I will plan the meals and say, okay, this is what we're doing. We'll do this Saturday. I'll say, hey, guys, we're going to have um, egg frittatas. What about some chicken curry? I don't ask the kids because they, you know, I mean, one is two and the other one is four just trying to get one from not peeing on the wall, you know, like it's, <laughs> it, it's just, it's that. We plan it out. We decide kind of what we're going to have for the week and then that's cooked. And that's on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And the other and aspect- you grocery shop on Sunday too? We grocery shop a lot because we want, we run through a lot of food. Okay. But yes, we typically grocery shop, do a large grocery shop. We try to go to the farmer's market and we go to the farmer's market um, the first and third Sunday of every month. And you're actually making the meals on Sunday as well. Sometimes, yes, we make the meals on Sunday. Sometimes we have help making the meals, but yeah. yes, either myself or someone else will come in and help us prep. You know, yeah. it just depends on how, like, for example, I'm traveling this week. Totally. Um, Which if you can afford that, that is one of the best hacks in life yes. ever. And obviously there's a bunch of people who can't, but it's actually not as expensive it's as not. people think. It's not. There's this guy, his name is Michael Girdley. He lives in Texas and he wrote this whole post about how him spending money, we don't have to bring it up, Tessa, but let's link to it in the show notes. Um, he's an entrepreneur. He has resources and means, but he wrote it in a way that really helped people think about how much time in their life opens up when they can get a little bit of help and that it's not as expensive as they think. That's absolutely and right. And it also makes you much more likely to eat healthier. And people don't realize how much money they spend on fucking Uber Eats. I agree. People spend a lot of money. <laughs> on Uber Eats yeah. and yeah, yeah, things yeah. like that yeah. for those that are ordering there. Yeah. And once you actually tally it up and you look at your Amex or whatever you're spending it on, you can kind of see that like, actually, okay, it's maybe comparable or a little bit cheaper and you get help at home, but you're eating way healthier and you're hitting all these goals yeah. that you want in life. So we'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah. And I think that if people can afford food prep, they should, but there's other ways to do it. Let's say someone is super crazy, really busy. There's meal services. You can do fro you could literally do if you were really in a pinch, you could do frozen meals. Meal Is there service. a frozen meal service out there that you would I mean, sign off on? I, I mean, I love icon meals. Have icon. you heard of them? No. Yeah. Not familiar with them. Super simple. Here's your beef, here's your rice, nothing complicated. Yeah. And they make it in a price point that people can afford. Got it. Um, so we will plan on Sundays all of that stuff. And then the other thing that I do is I always order and have on hand, we have a, a really organized pantry. I have on hand snacks for the kids. 
and they are there's like seaweed and beef jerky sticks and just all kinds of healthy snacks on hand so they can grab it easy yeah zooming out for a second so really if the biggest blockage is the preparation which goes into the whole component that you just unpacked it's really making food in a way sorry to jump around for a second in a way we've become so privileged in America yes. and living the Western lifestyle, we've not had to make food a central part of our life, except for the thing that people wake up and feel, hey, I'm hungry. What do I need to eat right now? But for a long time in traditional societies around the world and still many societies today, like you actually have to think about food on a regular basis. And we need to kind of bring some of that back. Otherwise, our health is going to get off track. Mm -hmm. That's part of what I'm hearing you say. Yes. And the other thing is, you know, I, I realize one of the, the questions that you asked is what are some of the biggest roadblocks is this idea that, you know, everything is this last meal. That's It's such a big deal. You're going to go out to eat. And, and I think really downplaying this idea of having a cheap meal or having some big meal because that really throws people off track. They're not able to kind of reel it in. It's almost as if they're overblowing this idea of a meal. Does that make sense? Like meals have turned into this whole uh, glamorized thing. That's instead right. Instead of just like, hey, just like what's tasty and good enough. Right. That allows you to focus on everything else that you want to do. Because it's a distraction. When people are thinking about, I'm restricting myself, I can't do this, oh, I just really want that piece of cake. I think that's all just very distracting. But part of also what I'm hearing you say is that if you prioritize protein and if you plan your day accordingly and you're doing meal prep, you're okay with somebody having some of the other things and they may not actually even be able to eat a lot of that stuff. One thing that I see is that when individuals, there's a neighbor of mine, I'm going to give her a shout out. Her name is Annie and she started training at the same gym that I started training in. And when they put a meal plan together for her that had the appropriate amount of protein and to like hit some of the goals that she wanted, she was like, initially, this is a lot of protein. It's a lot, it's a lot of food. It's for a lot people. of food. It mm -hmm. actually feels like very filling. Yeah. I had the same experience. It's like, whoa, like how am I going to eat all this stuff? Right. And yeah. you don't have room for a lot of things. That's right. That are, that are there. It augments willpower. And within that context, you're okay with people having, let me not put words in your mouth, but this is kind of partly what I feel like I've heard you say. Fine, if people want to have that dessert or they want to do that other thing or whatever, that's okay. But let's hit all these other goals first. Is that your idea? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because I was kind of was hearing two different things from you. I felt like I was hearing, it's not a big deal if you plan everything else. But in another way, when dessert becomes a regular part of your life at every meal, that's when people have all these distractions. Right. And if you're super excited about it, I mean, I, I would just want to kind of limit the pleasure that you think you are going to gain from it. From from food in general. From the birthday cake or the X, Y, and Z. I think people really fall off their nutrition plan when they overemphasize how exciting something is going to be. Yeah. There's something interesting that I saw when people start to get really focused and go on a plan like mm -hmm. this, and I had a similar thing. In a way, this idea of like overindulging in one meal starts to go away. It does. And fine, you want to have like like literally like there was times I'm not, I've never really been a big dessert person. I like a little dark chocolate. I'm an investor in Hugh chocolate. You know, uh, I'm a fan of dark chocolate, but I never was really like, oh, let me have that cake. Cake was never really like kind of like an appealing thing for me. Um, but I like fruit, you know, fruit has always been something that I've enjoyed. But even then still, when I would be out and somebody would order a dessert and they would feel like, oh, this is something that you have to try. I would have a little bit, I'd get the idea and I kind of move on. Right. And it's it's not just me who is not into desserts. I've seen that from a lot of other people that when you eat the appropriate amount of high quality calories, protein, you have the right amount of carbohydrates and fat inside the diet. And I have a few questions on that as well too. And you're getting those from a lot of whole food sources. You just don't have as much interest in other things that are there. I would say that that's right. Is that just goes back to satiety? I believe it does go back to satiety. And also, in part, you know that you're doing the right thing for yourself, right? You're eating whole healthy foods and you kind of want to stick to the plan. It's and so you're doing is... the right thing, but there's also this other thing where it's like, okay, a little cake here and there is not a big deal. This is the other thing that I didn't get a chance to tell you is that when I added on these 
eight point nine to ten pounds of lean muscle mass. Wait, but the depending. real question is: Did you have to buy all new suits, or what happened? No, no, because in a way, uh, I didn't grow my shoulders out. I still need like a few years to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't built out my my shoulders yet. I got to get some tips from your husband because he looks like <laughs> he has really good shoulders. Um, so not yet, not yet. Uh, but the interesting thing that happened for me, and I've shared this before on a few episodes is that as I added more lean muscle mass and I got on this structured plan of working out, which was about three to four days a week in the beginning, it was about three. And then I wanted to go a little bit more aggressive. And so I had about four days on average in a week of, uh, of training through, um, this group out here, their great ultimate performance. Um, I was very keen on regularly getting my labs done because part of what I was doing in addition to eating more protein is to optimize my training performance. They had me eating more carbohydrates than I was normally used to eating because I was doing the whole glucose tracking and I was trying to be mindful of my carbs and I was on that whole train, which the whole wellness world was on mm -hmm. at that time. This is about a year and a half ago. Not that I'm not mindful about carbs now. And this is a question that we're going to get into you, for you. But the interesting thing that I saw is that yes, I did end up cutting back fat from my diet because I was overeating and being a little bit generous with the calories that I was getting from fat. And that's how I was filling myself up. Mm. And now that I was filling up myself from protein, and I also was trying to dial in my body composition, I did end up cutting back some fat, but I was able to be a little bit more generous with the carbohydrates yes. in my diet. And every other month I was getting my metabolic labs done and I was seeing that my fasting insulin was still staying in the optimal range. Incredible. So let's talk about carbs yes. because there's so much confusion around that. You know, you're talking about muscle, how important muscle is. You're talking about protein as a big part of that. You've talked about working out. And then you actually have a little bit of a different take on carbohydrates than what a lot of people have talked about in the past. Yeah. So what's your take on carbs? I do not think carbohydrates are the enemy. And the average, the current RDA of carbohydrates is 130 grams per day. Depending on if you are exercising, could you go higher than that? Absolutely. And could you go lower than that? Yes, you could if you were metabolically impaired, meaning what does that mean? Had more than 10 pounds to lose or you have elevated levels of fasting blood glucose and elevated levels of triglycerides and elevated levels of insulin. But what's so amazing about skeletal muscle, which you actually witnessed, is that exercising muscle does not require insulin. You are able to utilize the carbohydrates without insulin. And that is amazing. Also, you earn your carbohydrates. For every hour of you know, moderate to vigorous activity, you could increase your carbohydrates from anywhere from 40 grams an hour to 60 grams an hour, even higher, which sounds like you did. So give us the whole spectrum of things because you know, lay the land because the audience is there, you know, they're listening to all these different podcasts. They feel like they're getting whiplash. Oh. They heard a whole bunch of people in the past talking about, hey, watch out for carbohydrates. Don't overdo it. I've done many episodes on this podcast with different experts that talk about this. And it would be that you're not disagreeing with them, but that's especially important for people who are living a very sedentary life, who are not stimulating Correct. their muscle through working out primarily, but also not getting adequate protein. And when you're living a sedentary lifestyle and you're starting off your day in the morning with a big, tall glass of oat milk latte, and then you're eating, you know, an avocado toast with a bunch of grapes, right? And then for lunch, you're eating a brown rice sort of with just the tiniest little bit of chicken inside of there. Right. And then for dinner, you know, to reward yourself, you're having a slice of pizza and some dessert. You're eating a lot of carbs, they may still be within the range that you're saying is appropriate, but it's a problem for that person because they aren't muscle centric and they're not prioritizing lean muscle mass. Right. And so all this glucose is floating around their body causing damage. Yes. Is that an yeah. appropriate way to think about I it? I would think, that, yes, that is. So those experts that came on the podcast that were talking about the problems with carbohydrates, they did have part of the story. But the complete part of the story is really this idea of muscle-centric medicine. Yes, I would agree with you. Okay. Because what is going to utilize, where are you going to put the glucose? 
if you are sedentary and you're eating these excess carbohydrates, which arguably you're absolutely right, people should not be, where are you going to put that glucose? The place you put it is healthy skeletal muscle. So if you are not exercising and you are sedentary, then your carbohydrate threshold or carbohydrate need is, is lower. And one more thing is that dietary protein, let's say for every 100 grams of dietary protein, you'll generate 60 grams of glucose. You don't actually need carbohydrates. I'm, I'm absolutely not against them. If an individual is metabolically unhealthy, then you have to control for calories. You have to prioritize protein and you do need to reduce carbohydrates. If somebody's metabolically unhealthy. Yeah. So like, give us some of those markers. Yeah. Somebody came in your clinic and you're deciding what to you know do with them and what plan to put them on. And let's say their labs came back as metabolically unhealthy. Yep. What would you see in there? So take us through like- Triglycerides. Triglycerides okay. over 100, 130, over Triglyceri 130s. If your yeah. triglycerides are high, yeah, that's one of the first indication that there's too much free-floating carbohydrates yeah, is, in the diet. Yes, this is not a good thing. Yeah, Over 130, I don't like. If your glucose levels are, again, if your fasting glucose levels are creeping past 100, I'm not excited about that. Mm -hmm. If your fasting insulin is elevated, this is not a good sign. Elevated means what? Meaning, you know, the the argument will say, I personally don't like to see fasting insulin above five, but that is an optimal range. Yeah. If you are creeping up above between 15 and 25, I mean, that's too high for me. That's too high of a fasting insulin level. Yeah. I've heard like people like Robert Lustig say like, even above 10, it's like, hey, we got a little bit of a yeah. red alert, Yeah. right? Three to five might be in the optimal category. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of go back and forth because you don't want to be on a low carbohydrate diet for long periods of time, depending, because then what happens to your body, you know, do you kind of cause beta, pancreatic beta cell death? I'm not totally convinced. I, I, I still, the jury is still out for me as it relates to how long an individual can go low carbohydrate. For, you know, like if they need to, I can appreciate that. But if they are metabolically healthy and flexible, I think that there is some benefit to adding some carbohydrates in as opposed to being chronically uh, low carb. So do you feel like there's some people that even if it's well-intentioned, they're causing unnecessary fear by having people focus too much on carbohydrates? Kind of in this wellness world yeah. that we live in. I think that there's a lot of fear in general in the wellness world industry and that mm -hmm. wellness world. And my hope is that we can clear that up and provide a framework, just an evidence-based framework of how we're going to navigate that space. I do think that people have put a lot of fear, whether it's a fear of protein, whether it's a fear of fat, whether it's a fear of carbohydrates, it's very convoluted. Yes. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. We have natural systems of satiety that we've hijacked. Some of the best studies in nutrition that exist are some of the studies I'm about to talk about. 